Hey guys, welcome to another Friday night, another night of uh, lawn care questions answered. Welcome to the Ron Henry Lawn Care live stream where I take your lawn care questions. All, it's all about you guys. Uh, so any uh, concerns you guys have, anything that you're working on, any projects that you have for the spring, uh, we are here to serve and to answer as best we can. So let's see what we got going on. Who we have in the uh, in the live stream tonight? We see LG is in the house. He's here first. LG has the honor of being first tonight. Uh, Super TA. Uh, let's see what else we got. Josh, Pacific North Lawns, uh, Daryl, Michael. Yeah, that's pretty awesome, guys. Uh, Jim. Yeah, hope all you guys are uh, are doing well and uh, and and you know looking forward to a, to a great night. So, um, so a couple of things that um, that have uh, there that are new new developments. Um, you got, if you guys have been following uh, Instagram or following um, you know the uh, the the YouTube announcements uh, this past week, I uh, launched the golf course lawn store. So as far as being able to find things like your pre-emergent sold test kits, uh, you can now go for it, go there for that. So let me show you guys what that looks like. I'm actually uh, very very proud of it. How it came out. Uh, let's see here, Safari. There we go. Um, so you can see. Uh, so what we've got on here, are like the MySoul test kits, um, some of the uh, Prodiamine and uh, other pre-emergents um, from from Yardmaster. You guys know I've been doing videos on um, Prodiamine on pre-emergents here lately. Uh, you guys got gotten a lot of response, and you guys I think have gotten getting a lot of value out of that. Um, and for anyone else that's also looking to do. Uh, soil amendments, if you got to adjust your soil pH, we're in, we're in the season now where it's time to adjust those kinds of things. You can now get all that stuff now at uh, golfcourselawn.store. So uh, there you go. It's been, been a lot of fun and a lot uh, lot going into that, a lot of work uh, and a lot of help I've gotten from various people to get to put that together. So really happy that uh, that, that worked out pretty well. Let's see. What are the points? We, so, so you guys, is there anyone else excited this weekend? We have um, Super Bowl weekend, man. So we should be interesting, interesting to see who you guys are are cheering for. I, I'd, I'd like to, I mean, either way, it's going to be an interesting game. If Mahomes wins, it's going to be cool. If Brady wins, it'll be cool. So uh should be a uh, a good time. Um, it, it's it's funny. I hope, hope I was hoping for an earlier spring, but now we've gotten a cold snap here in Georgia. So things have really uh, gotten, gotten cold. I still went out and I still mowed the lawn today, literally before the live stream I was, I was out um, mowing. So just to, you know, get a little sweat, just have, have a little fun, knock, knock the little, uh, knock the little high points off a little bit. Uh, but let's see, let's see what questions we have. Let's see if we have any questions queued up for tonight. Uh, Alexander, thanks for comfort for, for chiming in. Uh, our guest tonight, Jake says he's going to be a little bit late. So I guess we'll just wait for, uh, we'll, we'll see him when, when he gets here. Who else we have here? SMK in the house. Uh, George is in the house. Um, let's see what other, uh, what other questions do we have? So, so Jose uh, Alvarez, he says, hey, Ron, thanks for advising me to purchase the Pennington fertilizer from Milan. Yeah, you're very welcome, man. Um, it's It was it was cool uh, getting those. I think you, you sent me the soil test results, looking over those and seeing what your lawn is missing. Like now's the time, guys. If you guys have not, um, if you're looking for a time of the year to do soil testing, now's a great time to do it. Uh, frankly, because, you know, spring's going to be here pretty soon, at least for our warm season guys, our go time's going to be coming soon. And if you want to know what kind of amendments you need to do to your soil as far as, you know, maybe perhaps adjusting soil pH or any other major changes, like getting a soil test done has been uh, is a really good way to know that you're you're intelligently fertilizing the lawn. You're intelligently feeding the soil exactly what it needs. Um, but yeah, Jose sent me his soil test and I went through it and gave him some um, some advice. So uh, so that was um, that was good. I'm glad that you got some some value out of it, sir. Let's see who else we got here in the house. A Bermuda Brian is in the house. <laughs> yeah, man. I'm glad you guys are are coming to hang out. Um, and let's see uh, what else we have. Alexander Thomas is talking about pre-emergent. He says, hey, Ron, this rain is killing me. I got to hold off on my pre-emergent in Bama. Yeah, I hear you, man. So it's kind of a catch-22, right? So it, it, the, the thing is with um, with pre-emergent, you, you want to water it in. So like the prodiamine, whether you put it down in a liquid or granular form, um, watering that in is is uh, is majorly important. So, you know, if you can get um, a a break in the rain or a break in the weather, whenever uh, you know you can get out there and put it down, it's good because it's free water, right? Uh, if you if you read the label for for prodiamine, the um, the uh, the manufacturer recommends putting down like a half an inch of water or so to, to kind of work the uh, the the herbicide down into the um, into the soil so you prevent that germination. So you know don't 
I mean, rain is actually a good thing if you can get the get the pre-emergent down. You know, as long as the, the, the your turf's not frozen, as long as your you know the temperatures are are you know amenable to it, you should uh, yeah, it's something you should absolutely uh, consider consider doing. Let's see what else we got here. So Travis is in the house, around the house with Pat, all the, all the guys, man. It's great. I'm glad you guys are are taking some time out of your Friday to hang out. Um, and then Lee Farmer says, he brings up a question here. He says, hey, Ron, I have voles. I think you probably meant moles. He says, I have moles in my lawn. Uh, he says, no, not moles, voles. I don't know. I'm not, dude, this is a first. You know, I um, I have never heard of voles before. He said, I stepped on a tunnel on a tunnel, and my foot sank six inches. Any tips to get rid of them? I don't have any tips because I've never heard of voles before. This is a first. I'm not, you're going to make me uh, Google that. I've never, uh, I've never heard of that one. Um, yeah, they look, look like a little mouse. Looks kind of like, uh, not quite like a mole, but looks like a little mouse. But no, I've never uh, had to deal with them before. I will take that question under advisement and, uh, and get an answer for you. Um, Lee, if you want an answer sooner, feel free to drop me an email here at ron at golfcourselon.com. Just shoot me your email address. I might have yours, I think. I think you've emailed me. I think we've been corresponding before in the past. But if not, um, shoot me an email just saying, hey, Ron, I was the guy that asked about um, about voles, and I will look into it, and I'll get uh, get an answer for you. So, uh, so yeah, that's... Uh, that's very cool. So again, sorry I don't have a better answer for you. And again, I'm, I'm going to learn something new because I've never heard of voles before. <laughs> That's a good one. All right. So uh, Jake uh, Jay Pompano uh, chimes in. He says, hey, last year I aerated four or five uh, in the spring and then four or five in the fall with my toe behind. It responded really well to it. Always made sure I was getting good water and growing anything to watch out for. So when you say aerate, are you talking, it sounds like you're doing core aeration. Uh, if you're doing it four or five times a year, that's that's a bunch, man. Um, most people, you know, if you can get them to aerate once a year, that's doing really really good. Like my lawn this year will get um, will get aerated uh, twice. So probably in um, late March, early April, I'll I'll do one just to kind of wake the turf up. Get you know get uh, get get my fertilizer down um, to kind of improve things from that standpoint. And then when I, when I top dress, if you guys haven't been following the um, the live stream or, or, or the channel, like my plan for, for this season, as soon as soil temps are consistently in the 60s, is to oversee the lawn, to oversee the back lawn again with Arden 15. So that's the whole process for that is going to be uh, another aeration. Uh, so aerating, top, um, verticutting, thinning out the turf, have this, have this whole thing planned. That's what I'm gonna I'm gonna try out um, some hydrotain as well as some other new uh, liquid fertilization products that I think you guys are gonna be pretty excited about. So it should be should be a good time. This should be a good season. It should be a lot of a lot of fun. As far as things to watch out for, uh, not really, Jay. I mean, I, ideally you want to aerate the lawn whenever it's actively growing. So it, so just just so it recovers faster. Here's the thing. I've um, I've aerated as early as early March, which is definitely against what, or not, I'm going to say definitely against, but not um, the traditional time to do it. And I've also aerated into May, which is around the time when most people um, would recommend that you do it. And I've had, I've had good results um, both ways. So yeah, there's nothing really that, I, that I'd say other than if, if you're going to aerate, it's a great time. If there's any kind of soil amendments you want to do, if you're planning on putting down any kind of carbon or uh, fertilizer, if you're trying to put down a, like humic, like a humic acid or something like that, now that's a great time to do it because you're you're opening up literally voids in uh, in throughout the entire lawn, and you're fast tracking whatever you're trying to put down. It's just going to get down into the turf uh, that much faster. So, you know, that's uh, yeah, nothing nothing really to watch out for other than just making sure that uh, that the turf is is um, you know you that you put down whatever products you want, and that ideally you do it whenever the turf has uh, enough time to recover. That that's the only thing I'd say. I mean, air, aerating is pretty um, is pretty uh, you know as long as the grass is going, you're good to go. All right, let's see what other uh, questions we have here. Uh, Kay Sheesh uh, is, is chiming in. He says, Ron, ripped up the old centipede lawn or placed with Tipway 419. A Bermuda lawn has been installed. Guys, you know, that's uh, always, always, uh, always a good time. Glad to hear that. He says, what would you use for leveling uh, base topsoil, sand, or a 70-30 mix of sand and soil? So I, I am a fan of a 70-30 of a mix. Um, here's why. And you can use top, just pure topsoil, and that's just going to introduce a ton of organic material. That's that's going to be cool, right? That's one way to do it, but that's not the best um, medium for for leveling because what's going to happen is that topsoil is going to break down, and then for the most part, whatever you started out with as far as unevenness, you're going to end up there all over again. So a 70-30 mix is, um, is what I would go for. 
if you the only negative so here's the thing you want, you want to keep in mind with this right if you if you do a 70 30 mix because that's what i did uh twice uh, uh last year uh well actually that's not true L last year the first time i did a 70 30 mix the second time i did 100 percent sand if you do a blend, the one thing you, you have to be kind of prepared for is that unless you've gotten really, really, really clean topsoil that's being mixed with this, um, it's highly likely that you are going to have some weeds introduced along with it. You know what I mean? So it's not it's one of these things where, um, you know, don't be surprised that if after you top dress, you're going to have some weeds that you that you didn't have before coming up in your lawn. Good example. Uh, last year when I when I top dressed um, with that 70, 30 sand mix, I, I had like a small spurge outbreak afterwards. That spurge came in. With the topsoil that was used for top dressing, um, so it, it so the the ideal way to do it, if you want my my opinion, is to aerate the lawn uh, and then put down some kind of um, of, of um, like some kind of carbon products, like a some kind of humic acid, something along those lines, some kind of organic material that is relatively clean, like compost that is clean. And then top dress salon on top of that with like masonry sand. So the second time I top dress salon, when we did Alex's lawn this year, we did just that. We used um, Carbon Pro G. We aerated, put Carbon Pro G down, which is um, a product uh, that Miramichi Green makes for Lesco. It's half compost, half biochar, and it's got a microbial package. So we use that as our organic material and then top just with 100% sand on top of it. And that second time, whenever we, um, we did the top dressing, and I also did my back lawn, I didn't have uh, nearly the issue with weeds. So that's one thing to consider. That that method is probably a little bit more expensive, but you are less likely to have to deal with weeds um, if you do that. But uh, but yeah, hopefully that, that helps answer your question. Congrats on the Tiffway 419, man. I'm sure you're going to uh you're going to to enjoy that. It's uh it's it's an I mean Tiffway 419 is a beautiful, beautiful grass type. And being Bermuda, you're just gonna be able to play a lot more and not have to worry about um you know, necessarily getting a bad result. The nice thing with Bermuda is that whenever, you, if you're t are starting to get into to taking care of your lawn yourself and you're doing things like PGR or getting into fertilization, if you have a slight oopsie, it's a great lawn type for that because it just it just recovers really easy. It's really hard to permanently uh, hurt Bermuda. Uh, let's see who else we had here. Uh, Higgy Pop is talking about having some trees removed. It says, he says, hey Ron, I just had three trees removed. Um, what do you recommend I should do for lawn repair? Okay, that's a great question. So. As far as, um, I don't know what kind of what kind of grass type you have, um, Higgy. If you don't mind, like chime in and let me know what kind of grass you're dealing with. But the, the one thing I'd say is, um, after you have the trees um, taken out, make sure whoever's doing it is also doing a good job of removing um, as much of the root as they can too. Because what, what, what you can run into, as because a viewer last week had this problem, is if they leave a lot of the root there over time, that can decay and break down. And um, that's gonna that can cause like sinking problems, and, and and if they leave too much root in there, you can have problems where the grass, the roots can't penetrate as deeply. So you really you want to get as much as the root out as possible. Um, outside of that, uh, you know, get the try and get the um, the the area where the trees were uh, as as level as you possibly can with the rest of the turf. If you can introduce some kind of of a product like a like a carbon pro G or some other microbial package, something to kind of help uh, jumpstart. Um, or, or help with rooting. That's going to be um, that's going to be good. So you know so, uh, what I what I might consider is is a um, is a fertilizer that contains um, some pho some phosphorus in it because that helps with rooting. And then outside of that, once you put the sod down, um, just compacting it, making sure that you've got it. You know you've got everything as as smooth as possible because regardless of how good a job you do, right? Regardless of how good a job you do smoothing it out and laying sod, it's not going to be at, it's not going to be perfectly uh, perfect match to the existing turf. So the better job you can do with um, with preparing the turf and getting it get preparing the, the, the area where the trees were um, before you put the sod down, the less like top dressing work you're going to have to do after the fact to kind of clean up any uneven areas. But good job, man, because like people a lot of people don't realize that like every week and we'll probably get some questions tonight on that is that uh, you know, sunlight, like, you know, I talk about the Triforce. I got, a, I got a bunch of, uh, uh, laughs about that, but the Triforce of growing really, really good turf are, um, one, like have good soil. Like, so make sure you do your soil test and give the soil the right um, level of macro micronutrients, make sure the pH is where it needs to be. So that's step one. Um, the other is mow your turf frequently. So mow a lot, you know, the more you mow, the better the lawn's going to look. But then the third one, and it's often overlooked is sunlight. Like sunlight is the engine that powers all this stuff. You can have, like you can have all your parameters for your soil being absolutely perfect. Um, but if there's not getting, if the turf's not getting enough sun, the grass is just never going to do well. So the fact that you had these trees removed, uh, shows you're, you're pretty serious about, um, getting your grass to grow there. So good on you. And it's, and I, I think you're going to, you're going to, you're going to do well. Um, hopefully that advice, 
uh, helps you out. If you have any other questions, definitely let me know. Just kind of chime in below, and uh, we will uh, we will will you know I'll help you out with it. Let's see what other questions do we have. Uh, Papa Mo's low. He says, "A hey, like the new site. Thank you, sir. I appreciate it." Um, two questions. One, can I send you my new soil test for advice? Absolutely, you can. Yeah. Um, and if you and for any of you guys that are, um, it's a good question. Before I get to the second part of your question, is um, if you guys send me uh, a question saying like, what kind of fertilizer should I put down? What should I do to my lawn? Those kinds of things. Make sure you you, you email me soil test results with it because if you say, hey, Ron, what fertilizer should I put down? And there's no soil test results along with that. It's really, it's like, I'm just going to be like, mm, you know, go down to Home Depot and like roll the dice and pick something off the shelf and use that. So the best, the, the reason why I asked for a soil test is not because I'm necessarily trying to sell a bunch of soil test kits. It's really so that whenever you go out and you spend money on a, a product for your lawn, that it's the right, it's a right match. It's as close a good ma as a ma of a good match as we can get. So um, yes, Papa Lismo, you absolutely can send me your soil test results. And the second um, point says, looking at your older website, you recommended Milo um, or so, and I went and bought enough for the year. Do you still recommend Milo? Yeah, so here's the thing. For people that are getting into um, lawn care, that are getting that are getting new to that are new to it, the reason why, why I, I, I always say go with Milo when you're first starting out um, is because it's really hard to mess up, right? A lot of the synthetic fertilizers, if you go a little heavy-handed, um, you can damage your lawn. You can absolutely, you can absolutely burn your lawn. Whereas Milo, if you follow the rate on, on the bag, and even if you go heavy, it's really, really difficult to get a bad result with malorganite. Um, the 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 negative to malorganite um, is that when you have a bigger lawn, um, and even a smaller lawn, really, the cost per application. So if you do the, the math on what it costs to um, you know to, to apply malorganite per thousand square feet compared to some of the more synthetic fertilizers, some of the offerings from Lebanon Turf um, and, and those those types of fertilizers, it is it is actually more expensive than using one of the more synthetic ones. So for my lawn, a good example, whenever I fertilized my lawn last year, if you guys were watching, um, I did, it took, I think, eight bags or so of Malorganite to do the entire lawn at the rate that I do it. So it's like a, it's like a hundred, it's well over a hundred dollars for an application, right? Versus like a synthetic product, you can spend, you know, 60, $60 for like a really, really, really good high quality fertilizer and like one bag can do the entire lawn. So yeah, I still, I still recommend it. It's, it's still, Malorganite is still a great product. Um, it's just, you know, as you as you um, do more and more in 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 the line, eventually you eventually you will you will graduate to products that and I hate to say graduate just to say that it's not good, but, it, but eventually you'll move to products that that can that will have all the benefits of malorganite, but then also will have some humic acid that will also have a little bit of sea kelp. You know, have have all these extra things that will help um, improve the soil outside of just um, adding uh, just nitrogen and and phosphorus to the lawn. So just just something to consider. I, I don't have any. Um, hate from Malorganite, still love it. It's a great fertilizer. It's just um, a little bit more expensive, um, at least for me, to apply that every single every single month, whenever for, for for my lawn care program. So hopefully that helps. And the new website um, still has that blog post. So the blog post you're talking about. Let's see if I can get to it here. If I can make this work, is uh, this one here? So the very top of the of the store, that blog post that I had on how to create a golf course lawn is still there. So I ported it over here. So the entire, like that that basic um, Malorganite calendar, which I think is, yeah, right here. Uh, so this is the basic calendar that shows you, you know, when I would do um, Malorganite, other, other fertilizer products is there. And then for the people that are more hardcore, at the very bottom, you're gonna have like the month by month um, breakdown. I'm gonna, I'm gonna be revising this throughout the year. Um, but yeah, that, that calendar is still up um, on the website. So if you go to the to the store, it's still there under, under blog. Uh, great question, um, Papa Moslo. I will look forward to uh, those uh, those soil test results. And uh, you know, if you got Milo, throw it down, man. You're going to get really good results with it. I'm sure. I think uh, you know, um, uh, Alex, uh, not Alex, uh, Alan still loves Malorganite as a uh, as a fertilizer. And then you know, it's it's because it's good. It's a, it's a great product. It really, really is. I'm not I'm not I'm not throwing any shade against Malorganite. And if you guys are enjoying the live stream, anyone that's, that's uh, settling in, as you sit down with your glass, in my case, a glass of like tasty lemonade and water. Be sure to uh, smash that like button. I really would appreciate it. It helps me, helps the channel, costs you guys nothing. How about that, man? You get to help the channel out and support me, and it's absolutely free, which is pretty, pretty awesome. So I'd appreciate that. Let's see what other questions here. We got a couple of super chats. Let me take care of those. So a super chat from uh, 
Keshish, and I'm sorry if I'm pronouncing your name incorrectly. Super chat received. And then another from Papa Mo's Low. Uh, here we go. Super chat received. And I appreciate it, guys. Thank you guys so much. You guys help. You guys are helping to support, uh, you know, fertilizer and all the testing and everything else that I do. And really appreciate you guys uh, supporting uh, the channel. Uh, so let's see what other questions we have here. So Chris Jones chiming in. What's going on? And Stan, oh, I, hit, I said Chris and I hit Stan's. Uh, so Chris, thanks for chiming in. Uh, Homestead, Florida, nice. See, I'm you know I'm jealous of you guys in Florida. I look at some of the videos of um, of Alan and Brett uh, the, on like on on Instagram, and yeah, they're kind of bundled up a little bit. But the weather in Florida is so much nicer than here, man. I I really you know I kind of wish we had that Florida weather from a standpoint of being able to get started earlier. So uh, so yeah, yeah. Teed up Jay's in the house. Then Brooklyn Brooklyn boy has another question for us. This is a good one. He says, uh, can I apply pre-emergent and post-emergent at the same time? Um, uh, yes and no. I mean, here's the thing. I, 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 would, I, would, I personally wouldn't, and here's why. A lot of the post-emergents, a lot of the post-emergent herbicides are designed to be applied um, with a surfactant. So take like, um, let's take like uh, Certainty, for example. I think Certainty, Certainty is a good example, if memory serves me right. Like that one's a really, really good sir, um, um, herbicide. It's, it's, it's really good against Poana as a, as a post-emergent, but it's designed to be applied with a surfactant, right? Meaning it's designed to, to be applied and to kind of stick to the leaf of the plant that you're trying to kill uh, to be most effective. Whereas most pre or not most, but like all pre-emergents, they need to be watered in. So that's why that video that I did showing applying um, uh, image and prodiamine, those two play nicely together in the sense that like, yeah, one is a pre-emergent, one is also a post-emergent, but they both, but the way that they, they attack the plant um, is, is from the root system. So it, they're beneficial. So when you, when you water them both in, when you water um, that concoction and that mixture of prodiamine and image, you're not working against yourself versus if you went and you put down, let's say you mixed um, certainty and prodiamine, right? You apply the prodiamine, you apply the certainty. I guess technically you could do that and then wait a couple of days and then water the pre-emergent in. But again, you're just you're, you're kind of working against yourself. So the answer is is yes. Um, but it but I, I would I would pay attention to the mode to the action, the mode of action, like how the herbicide, the post-emergent that you're trying to use works, and try and match it to the pre-emergent. I, ideally, ones that behave like that that work like how image does, where it is. Um, watered in, um, you know, where, where it needs to be watered in is ideal. That's what you are, are really after. If that, if that makes a lot of sense. Uh, let's see here. What other questions do we have? Um, this is, uh, let's see what other questions we have one here from Michael Harmer saying, Hey, Ron, currently changing out pressure relief valve on my water heater. Cool. Okay. Good to, good to know. Hey guys, it looks like, uh, Jake is here. Let's see if I can, if I can bring him into the live stream. Let me, um, let's see if he uh, is popped in. I've answered, but I don't see him. Uh, let's see. Okay, we'll, we'll keep, we'll keep getting, um, getting questions, taking questions until uh, uh, Jake pops up. So I guess, Jake, if you're here, just like, uh, like ping it, ping in the, um, in the, uh, in the thing and we'll, uh, we'll, we'll bring you on. All right. Um, so Lee Farmer, let's, it says, he says, says smoke bumps rid of his vol problem. So there you go. So there's, there's someone that has, um, that has dealt with volts. I don't even know what they are. LG uh, knows all about those. So it looks like you're uh, like, that's, that's a, a problem for you on that. Uh, let's see. Uh, Brooklyn Boy says triplet SF, your thoughts. I've never used triplet. Uh, I've heard of the herbicide, but I've never actually used it. So I, I, let me do some research on it and find out, um, if it's one that you can mix with pre-emergence, I, I don't, I don't know for sure. So, um, but yeah, uh, but yeah, so I, I don't, I, I can't give you an answer on that one uh, quite yet, uh, uh, Brooklyn boy. Uh, let's see. Question is, should I apply peat moss in the spring or the fall? Um, you know, it, it depends. I guess it depends, like one, why you're applying peat moss. The, the times I really seen peat moss applied is whenever you are doing them along with um when you're whenever you're applying them along with a like an a seeding project or something like that um just as as a, as a means of just applying it i don't know why you just put it down just just by itself for no other reason okay guys let me see if i can bring jake in here let me switch over to another window and uh let me yeah. add him uh jake you there yeah can you hear me yeah yeah there we go yeah there we All go all right so perfect there we go all right, guys. So um, our guest for tonight is uh, Jake the Lawn Kid. Jake, thanks for uh, 
for for popping in tonight. And uh, yeah, so we can we can take questions. And here's the thing, guys. Part of uh, what we have Jake in is that you know a lot of you guys, uh, you cool season guys, always say you know you guys never get any love. You know, it's all about warm season. You know, why why can't we have some cool season guys? And so that's where we have Jake tonight. And uh, you know, so if you, so the, the way the format's going to still be the same. We'll still take questions. I mean, I have a couple of talking points we'll go through. But uh, feel free to throw your um, your questions, and we'll and Jake and I can go back and forth and and just uh, you know answer them as best we can. So Jake, um, so what's new with you, man? What's I know it's your it's snowing or cold where you are, but like what are your uh, you know what's new with you and YouTube channel or your plans for uh, for twenty twenty one? Nothing much, man. Just looking forward to a great year, making content uh, that fits the now. I get a lot of questions right now about snow on the lawn, what to do about that, snow mold. That's another big one. And right. on top of that, we got some we got some fun snowblower reviews coming up from our good friends over at Toro and Snapper Simplicity. So it'll nice. be a lot of fun. Nice, yeah. I, I I noticed that. So a lot of you guys, like um, George Princess Cut Lawn Care, a couple of the other guys, like seems like during the winter time, a lot of the northern um, YouTubers that are, are buried in snow, you guys switch over to like to some of the snowblower content, which is um, I guess pretty pretty useful for um, for lawn care. So you're gonna be doing some stuff with Toro then. Yeah, and then for those who don't know, I also make videos on the Next DIY Lawn Channel over at Green County Fertilizer. Um, over there, one of the things we've been doing as we head into the season is we're actually making step-by-step -step program videos for the season for both warm and cool season grass. The cool season video is live up there if you want to check it out and start plotting and getting excited for the season. But for my warm season friends, your video will be coming hopefully by the beginning of next week. I just shot it today, so cool, a lot of fun. Cool. Yeah, so anyone that's using that's using that particular fertilizer brand, uh, yeah, you should be uh, you should be good to go. Um, so let's so you know it's it's funny. Um, so when it comes to a question I had for you, uh, Jake, is as far as um, cool season grass, I, same kind of question I asked Alan. Um, as far as bagging or mulching, I mean, right now you're not doing any either of that. But as as a, mm -hmm. as a matter of practice for you guys, do you guys tend to bag your clippings or mulch them? Um, I just wonder if it's any different for cool season versus warm season grass. Okay, so for uh, cool season grass and warm season grass, it's pretty much the same. We like to mulch our clippings up here, but that's really because most of us who do cool season lawn care in the in the real world, I don't mean for that to sound like crazy, because what, what I'm saying is most of us don't real mow. That's really what I'm trying to say. And mm -hmm. when we don't real mow and we cut our grass at maybe two and a half, three, maybe even four inches tall, it's a good idea to recycle those nutrients and put them back into the lawn. So in return, we don't have to compensate with as much nitrogen as we would if we were bagging. So that's kind of the idea behind that is we're recycling our fertilizer nutrients in a different form. Now, for those of you who do bag, that's good. Keep doing your thing. I'm sure your lawn looks good for a reason. So yeah, to each his own. Right, right. Yeah. So same. So okay. So so same thing. I mean, we you know down here at warm season we don't really like. I don't. I typically don't bag my clippings. I mean, outside of like uh, scalping the lawn or like I'm trying to if I'm trying to take material out. Like whenever I uh, verticut, like in that case, I, when I'm tr like trying to thin the lawn out, I'll remove material. But as a matter of practice, I I tend to not um, do that uh, either. Uh, let's see, we got a point from from um, SMK. Uh, so SMK makes a good point. He says, "Hey, I'm just wondering why you guys are putting down pre-emergence so early. Nighttime lows are still in the 20s and 30s here in Georgia. Late February or March should be best. The uh, time to app is when azaleas first start blooming." Great point, SMK. Um, you know, I was kind of hoping that we would get uh, an, an early. Uh, I mean, when I, whenever we did Alex's lawn. Uh, things were a lot warmer, we were, but you are absolutely right. We have gotten a cold snap. I have seen the lawn care services around here actually already running around, um, putting down pre-emergent. So I, I, it's, I guess, um, you, you are absolutely right. Whenever temps get a little bit warmer, um, or soil temps get a little bit warmer, that would be more of an ideal time. Um, but you know, uh, in, in, in our, in my case, I thought that we were going to, we we're going to get Things were, going to, things were going to stay a little warmer than they did, but uh, even even around here already, at least in my neighborhood, the 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 pros are already are already out doing it. Probably because they, um, you know, if you have like tons of lawns to get to, um, that it's 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 you have to kind of like get started early to kind of stagger your uh, your your application, your application. But great great point, and you're you're absolutely like thanks thanks for chiming in, sir. I always appreciate um, your uh, your insights. Um, so speaking of pre-emergence, um, Jake, like what do you guys use for pre-emergence? Are you guys also prodiamine up there up north too, or do you use something special? Yeah, we use prodiamine and dithiapyr. We use them interchangeably. Okay, cool. And in, in your case, do you do a single heavy app or are you a split app guy or um, what's, what's your... I'm a, I'm, a split up, I'm a split app guy. So what I like to do is I like to start in the springtime when soil temperatures hit 55 degrees. I go sure. in with my prodiamine. 
It's usually at the end of March for me, might be different depending on where you're at. But uh, then I come back around mid to late May leading into Memorial Day. That's when soil temperatures are up to 70, which is when I put down my second one. Mm -hmm. And I put down my, I, that's when I put down dithiopyr. So I like okay. to rotate between the two. And I don't put down a third pre-emergent until around September. Now that, of course, assumes I'm not seeding. There are products out there like Mezzotrione that are being sold that you can use with your seed. However, I don't really recommend that. I just think it's better to do one or the other. Right. So if I'm seeding, I just go ahead and seed and skip the third pre-emergent altogether. If mm -hmm. I'm not seeding, I get down that third pre-emergent and it gets me the coverage against all of the winter weeds that we talk about like Poa annua. Cool. Very cool. Yeah. Sounds, it sounds good. So kind of like you, like this, this year, my lawn is not going to see any pre-emergent, um, until the fall at best, because I have a, I have a, I have a seeding project planned and you know, it's, you figure if, if I did it now, I mean, so I, I'm not gonna be putting down seed until May. So, you know, that's kind of around the time when the pre-emergent is going to be falling off, but as expensive as grass yeah. seed is, it's just not, I just not, not going to risk it. You know, I'll just, I'll just deal with, uh, with the weeds and uh and if anything just just uh spray um just spray them out after after the lawn kind of uh catches up you know once once the, the new seed derm germase is doing well i just don't i mean like i was telling someone else earlier today you know the seed i'm using arden 15 i don't know what cool season grass costs but it's like 400 it's well over 400 dollars for a 25 pound bag of this stuff so you just don't want to you want you want to give yourself every opportunity for it to go uh for it to go well cool very, 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 very cool. Uh, so uh, let's see here. So um, Maestro Milan kind of talking about that. I said, should I still spray Prodiamine in the next few days if it's going to freeze? Um, I, I would wait, um, Meister. I mean, you can wait, uh, you know, a week or, week or two. I mean, it's it's that's going to be fine. It's not going to um, it's not going to materially affect things. The one thing you'll notice um, is because really what you're putting down now is to any pre emergent you're applying now is to prevent weeds, to prevent like warm weather weeds. So like crabgrass, spurge. Things like that. That's that's what you're trying to keep away. Um, if you've got Poana in your lawn already, you've already like either the fall pre-emergent that you put down, either you didn't put a fall pre-emergent down, or um, it's it's kind of fallen away. If you're if you want to deal with Poana like stuff you like that in your warm season grass, you're really looking at using you know image or using like certainty with a surfactant, something like something some kind of like post-emergent um, to take care of that. So it depends on what you're trying to do. If you're really just looking for um, doing for taking care of spring weeds, you can wait a little bit longer if you like without issue. But yeah, cool. Yeah. Yep, yep, very, very cool. Uh, so we have a question here from James Dean. Uh, I, I, you can probably take this one if you want. Uh, Jake he says, "Oh, says Ron, uh, recommendations on a budget backpack spreader possible to get consistency um, spreading by hand." So when you say spread, I think you're talking about sprayer, right, James? Or yeah, backpack sprayer. I think you're talking about sprayer, yeah, yeah. So, 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 what's your what's your what's your backpack sprayer of choice? What's your your favorite? So that's a good one because I've had experience with a couple of them. Uh, mm -hmm. Sprayers Plus, those folks are really nice. I love Sprayers Plus. They make great handheld and backpack sprayers. Another one I've been messing with recently is Petra. Okay. Um, I still have yet to test those a little bit more until I can recommend them. But uh, in the meantime, I highly recommend the Sprayers Plus. Great sprayers. Take the Sprayers Plus. Cool. So I've never used any of those. Last week I had a question about the Petra, and I, because I've never used one, um, I couldn't really say. I, I mean, uh, James, the two, the two sprayers that I've used are the Chapin, which I know gets a lot of hate. Some people like the Chapin. Some people hate the Chapin. I have had nothing but really good results with mine. Uh, so for for a a cheaper, um, a, I hate to say cheaper, but more, but a more budget sprayer that it, I, it's going to serve you pretty well. I like the Chapin. Um, and as far as like having calibration data for it, if you want, I already have a lot of that for it um, already done for you, if you in case you're interested. So, but you, you can't go wrong. There's a lot of people getting into that market, um, like the Petra, the, um, you know, again, the Chapin has been one that's been around for a while. So it just depends on on which which you uh, you like. You're not going to really go wrong with um, with uh, with either of them. Uh, so let's see. Here's here. one what I'd like that? to answer. What's that? Here's one I'd like to answer. What's that? What you got? This kind of uh, goes... So this kind of goes back to the pre-emergent question. This is from On The Lawn Training. He says, hey, JTLK, you said that you like to rotate the pre-emergents. What's the reason for that? Well, I'd be glad to tell you. So uh, let me let me add this um, one. There you go. There you go. Yeah, on the perfect. Now, huh? There we go. There he is on the lawn. What's up, buddy? So uh, yeah, with, with priamine and dithiopyr, especially when you limit yourself to using those two, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, one of the things that you will run into if you use too much of one product, if you decide to use it a little more than what you would typically do in the year, 
um, is yearly maximums, right? Mm -hmm. So one thing you could do to prevent um, possibly meeting that yearly maximum or going over it is rotating between the two or maybe using one product the first two times and the third time you use the dithiopure. Sure. So another reason I like to do it the way I do it, where I use the dithiopure a little bit later is because priming, there's just something about it. It's got a sticking figure to it. So when you get those early spring rains, it's going to, you know, build a nice barrier down in the soil. Whereas the dithiopure, it's more developed um, for later season weeds. And because of that, using those two that way, I've just gotten the best results. Very cool. Very cool. And, and I guess by using also using multiple pre-emergence there, the, you know, as far as the ability or the or the, the reducing the likelihood of any kind of resistance being built up. I mean, prodiamine and dithiopure are, are like standards, right? But if you kept yep. using the same one over and over and over again, it's possible that over time you could do resistance, build up a resistance versus by rotating them. You're not, you're one, you're staying away from those limits. And to your point, like, whereas um, prodiamine is strictly pre-emergent dithiopare also has some post-emergent um, benefits as well too. So that's why it's also cost a little bit more. So um, great question. Awesome question. Yeah, great question. Thank you. Yep, great question. All right, so a question here from Static Alpha. Question about top dressing, a, 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 a term near and dear to my heart. He says, Ron, do you recommend me to top dress the lawn at the same time of seeding or doing it weeks before my renovation? I, you know, I'm going to do it all at the same time. Um, but remember, the top dressing I'm going to be doing is a light one. So my um, my plan uh, for for this year is whenever I aerate, verticut, um, put down like um, a wetting agent. So I'm, I'm probably going to try out um, one of the products from Hydrotain. Um, you know, whatever fertilizer of choice that I'm going to be using at that time. You guys have to wait to see that. And then the seed and the re and part of why I want to do the top dressing is that two two reasons. One. It gives me a nice um, barrier to add a little bit of soy seal, um, soy soil seed contact to improve that, and it's also a nice way for me to just to get to get the leveling of my lawn done at the same time. So the top dressing I'm doing is not going to be a super heavy one. Um, what you'll find is some people that are doing overseeding will often use like peat moss or something along those lines, but because I want to top dress this year, anyways, uh, that's why I'm combining those two. So I would not say that. Top dressing is strictly is is a requirement for seeding, but if you are planning to do it, that's a great time to um to go about um to go about doing that. At least in in, in my opinion, that's the plan that I'm I am going with. Um, so Jake, when it comes to um things like PGR, what about um on? So I know it's definitely a warm season lawn type thing. Uh, plant growth regulator, something you guys you, you use very much, or any any thoughts on it? So obviously, based on what I've heard about it, basically what it does is it reduces the amount of growth that your lawn has in, say, a week time, right? Uh, I up to a month. The best way for it. Yeah, oh, up to a month. So depending on the kind, like the one I use, TNX, it can be you know three to four weeks of regulation, depending. Yep. Mm -hmm. So, as as someone who's you know just up and coming as a uh, lawn as a lawn kid, you know, growing up into the twenties realm. I don't know a lot of people personally that use it. As a matter of fact, I don't know a lot of people who are crazy about their lawn like that. I mean that in the best of ways, guys. I love you. Right. Um, but yeah, I think I think one of the biggest things with me is I I don't think it's bad. I just I've ne I've never heard of it. I've never messed with it. So I, got you. I, I really wouldn't know. Sure, sure. Yeah, no problem. I mean, and the thing is, PG plant growth regulators really for a cool season lawn where you or guys are mowing at higher, you know, higher heights of cut. You're at two, three inches, that kind of thing. Um, you know, if you're out there mowing, you know, a couple once a week or every, you know, once every, once every couple, every few, but not a few days, but say once a week is, that's probably going to be good enough for a cool season lawn to maintain the height you're after. But the thing is when, with, um, with Bermuda or any other warm season grass, once you start getting down to like half an inch, really under an inch, really, um, and you're trying to not violate that one third at a time rule, like you think at, at one inch, like you're cutting off no more than one third of an inch at a time. So, you know, especially during the summer months when Bermuda is really taking off and growing aggressively, if you don't want to be out there mowing every single day or, you know, every other day, um, plant growth regulator is a tool you can use to kind of, you know, to, to, to reduce that. Um, but yeah, but I, get, I think it's probably more of a warm season, uh, grass type thing because it's, it, again, it doesn't really make a lot of sense, I guess, if you're, if you're maintaining higher, um, heights of cut. Uh, let's see. Edward has a question. He says, are you thinking of making an app like Yard Mastery? I can I, I can confirm that I am not thinking about making an app like Yard Mastery. The Yard Mastery app is good. So just just use that one. Yeah. It's, I mean, here's the thing. You don't realize it's, that's a that's a lot of work to create uh, an iOS and Android app like that. It's not it's not just, you know, a weekend's amount of, amount of work. And even if you could create one, um, it is 
it's uh, there's all the maintenance and everything that goes into it, right? Because once you once you put an app out there, whenever there's bug fixes or there's new piece, new versions of iOS that come out, they take features away. You get it pretty much you have to have a development shop at that point, and that's just not something that um that I am looking to to take on at this point at all. That's that's uh, Alan Alan the guys have already got that problem solved, so no point in solving the same problem uh, again. Uh, let's see here. Um, so, uh, so Jake, as far as common lawn care mistakes, like whenever you look at people making mistakes in their lawn, what's the common mistakes that you see, I guess, in, on cool season lawns that you see people making? So I'm going to go ahead and so we're gonna, I'm going to go ahead and say three and I'm going to narrow it down to one. So let me explain what I mean by that. One of the biggest mistakes I see in lawn care is mm-hmm. people not mastering the big three, but the mowing. Big three fertilizing and irrigation. Okay. When I drive around my, my neighborhood every time, no matter what time of year it is, I see people not cutting their lawns enough or they're cutting it too low or even worse, they'll let their lawn go a month into dormancy and then they'll decide all of a sudden on a Friday night that they want to start pumping the, the crap out of it with water. And right. then as far as fertilizer goes, oh, just go get a bag and throw it down. No, you actually need to read the label. Label is law. So that's one of the biggest mistakes that I would see. Yep. So, so not, not mowing. It's, it's funny because it's, uh, you know, I'll, I'll get a, um, I'll sometimes I'll, I'll get questions from viewers. Someone will email me and they'll send me a picture of their lawn. They'll send me send total test results and everything is, the, the grass looks gorgeous. The color is really nice, nice and dense. Um, you know, they say, well, what product should I apply to my lawn? I said, well, all your soil, all your soil parameters, the pH is on point. You know, all your, your macro micronutrients look good. Uh, you just got to mow it more, man. Like just cut it. Like if you want your grass to look good, like one of the best things you can do is just simply run the lawn more on it more. Like that's one of the, like the reason why golf course, well, that's the only reason why, but a big reason why golf course fairways and greens look why they do is not only because of the products they apply, it's because they are mowed a lot. Like greens are mowed every single day. Fairways, you know, a couple times, several times a week. So the as a general rule, the more often you mow your grass, the, uh, the better it's going to look. All right. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So, so um, when Cherry does a point here about pre-emergence, I did not put down pre-emergent last fall because I am overseeding this spring of Bermuda. I am now seeding a few, I'm now seeing a few winter weeds pop up that I need to spray. What's a good herbicide for this application? Okay, so um, if you put down a, here's the thing, when Cherry, even if you're planning to, and it doesn't really matter at this point, but if you were planning to, to, to seed your Bermuda lawn in the spring, you're still, you still would have been fine to put down pre-emergent in the fall. I mean, it's like the, the effective period of most pre-emergence is, you know, four to five months in most cases. If you're using one of the, like the really nice ones, like the, um, the spectacle flow, like the one from Bear, like the like one of some of the more high end, really expensive pre-emergence, those have a lot, have a bit longer, but in most cases, you if you put down in the fall, you're going to be fine to still seed um, in the spring. As far as winter weeds that you want to you want to spot spray, um, it depends. A couple things. Uh, if you're saying winter weeds with a, with a warm season grass, warm season lawn, I'm assuming you're probably dealing with poa poana. That's with that one on the cheap. You can go with. Um, you can do something like uh, like image, like the video that I put out. You can use something like that. If you yeah. have um, more money to spend, you can use um, you can use negate. That's that's an option, or you can use certainty with a surfactant. So those are all all options for um, for spot spraying. And those those the thing is, and as far as like um, speed of how quickly it's going to kill the grass, it's kind of in that order. So the image will work, but it's going to take three to five weeks to kill the poana. The other two that I mentioned um, in a couple of weeks is when you'll you'll see the poana um, the poana die off. So it just depends on um, on what you're after and how quickly you want the problem solved. If you want to, if you want to get um, certainty, um, I'll put a link here in a in a second um, in the chat for it where you can um, where you can pick that up. But if but if you do use that to spot spray um, you're, you're going to want to mix it with a, um, with a surfactant. You're not just gonna want to put it down for the best results. You want to use it with a, with a surfactant. Um, so Jake, a quick question. In, as far as you in the up North, what kind of, what kind of, um, weeds do you guys deal with this time of year? I mean, it's in, in cool season grass. Well, for us, it's nothing. It's pretty much it's snow, right? Yeah. It's just snow. That's the only weed we deal with. And then right. once we get to the spring, then once, once we get to the, the spring, the biggest one we deal with is dandelions in uh, mid to late spring. And then as we get into summer, it's mostly clover. Clover dominates everything around here. Yeah. We don't, I don't have that. And a little bit of spurge as well. Yeah. I don't, I don't, I don't really get, I don't have definitely not dandelion. Spurge is an issue 
um, down here. But the other one, those other two you listed, I've not, I've not, not had to deal with those. Spur- Spurge is nasty, man. I can't, I tell you, as far as I would rather deal yeah, with, okay. let me try to think about this. I'd rather deal with Nuts Edge than I would deal with Spurge. Spurge is so terrible because it's like one of the few weeds that literally, you know, cutting it at half inch, it's like all day, every day. It's like, bring it on, buddy. It's like, it's one of the few weeds you can cut it really low and it's still just, it just thrives. It just, it just kind of weaves into yeah. the Bermuda and just, and, and gets all, all fat, dumb and happy. So it's, um, it's a horrible, horrible, horrible weed. Hate Spurge. Uh, can't stand it. Here's uh, another one. There's another one called Creeping Ginny. That's another mm-hmm. bad one. Creepy yeah. Ginny just grows all over everything. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not how to deal with that one. Sp- Spurge and Nutsedge are my big ones that I have to deal with. He says uh, Alexander Thomas. Uh, he's talking to Jake. He says, "Hey Jake, you're not a kid anymore. I watch your videos also. That's true, dude. I mean, I remember watching your videos whenever you and um, Alan were making videos when he was still up up north. So yeah, it's cool to see how you're how you've grown, and how the channel's grown, and everything. Which no, is, it's um, cool. I enjoy that. I enjoy watching myself grow too. Because I think yeah. one of the hardest things, real quick. Uh, about being a creator especially when you're coming up and you're young Mm -hmm. is to be humble but to also be honest with what you've accomplished and just going back and looking at those old videos it just it helps me conquer that challenge and i love that sure 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 absolutely um yeah i mean it's like like you said anything like anything the biggest thing um you know if if there's any advice i could give anybody and you know i'm I'm a lot older than you but if is always regardless how old you you get there's always someone that knows more than you and always do your best in life to always be teachable so always be humble enough to be able to ask someone that knows more than you hey you know what do you think about xyz and because you're just you're just going to progress better that faster that way i mean there's i I am a firm believer it's kind of like the hacker's mantra that no problem should have to be solved twice so if you have someone that knows um a lot more about something than you do Lean on that. There's no reason to, to, to learn it all and figure it all out yourself. Uh, let's see. So Ray at Ray um, Scones has a point here. He says, uh, Ron, I just purchased a house with an acre. It's a lot. It's a lot of that's a lot of land to take care of. He says the previous owner let the grass get about three inches and the turf is not level in a lot of spots. When is it a good time to start lowering and leveling? Wow. Okay. So. Um, Ray, I'm, I'm going to assume that the grass that you're dealing with is warm season, is Bermuda. If, if it's not, let me know um, further down, like what kind of grass you're dealing with. Um, with an acre, I would not take all that on at one time. That's, I mean, that's 43,000 square feet. That's a lot to deal with um, all at once. Um, the thing is, as far as the height of cut, like how when to start bringing that down, the question you need to ask yourself is, one, like how much time do you have and how much time do you really want to dedicate to turf, to, to, grow, to mowing grass? Because, like you know, looking at looking at a, at a lawn or even portions of your lawn. So you, let's say you took, you took a like a, a front your front lawn. Let's say that's I don't know three five thousand square feet. Let's take that as an example, right? If you decide you want to cut that a lot lower, let's, again, I'm assuming in Bermuda, um, the the lower you cut, the more the lower you 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 want to maintain your lawn, the more frequently you have to cut it. So it's um, and then really once you with if you're dealing with Bermuda, once you get below an inch and a half you're really kind of starting to get into real mower territory to where to get the best possible results. So the the best, the, the way to answer your question is it depends largely on you and what you're trying to get out of it. I mean, Bermuda can look really good at two inches. It's gonna look even better lower, but it can look reasonably decent at like two, at a two inch height of cut. Um, and if you decide that that's what you wanna do, you can easily do that with a rotary. And as far as the time to start bringing that down, let's say you wanna maintain um, two inches. So you got like a like a zero turn or some piece of big equipment that you can use to, to, to mow the entire acre. If, you are, if your goal is to maintain the lawn at say two inches, what I would say is whenever um, we get a little closer to springtime and the Bermuda is beginning to wake up, is I would cut it just slightly shorter than that two inch height that you're trying to maintain that. So maybe like at, um, at an inch three quarters, right? Um, and and with that that light scalp is going to help that whatever grows back afterwards is going to you're gonna get a nice even green. It's gonna help the the, the turf to green up a little bit sooner. So it, it I, I sorry I don't have a better answer for you, but it really depends on on, on what you're trying to accomplish as far as um, leveling. Same the same kind of thing. When it, the the time to level your turf is whenever the grass is growing aggressively. So again in Georgia in my part of the country where I am that means mid May um, you know early June. That's the time when when top dressing makes a lot of sense. So but I mean but put some more comments in here um, below. And let me know. Um, again I'm assuming Bermuda, um, but just I guess. You know, really, really think about what you're getting into because I, put it this way, I have 12,000 square feet and that's a lot of work. An acre is over three times, almost four times that. So to top dress all that and maintain all that is like a full time, you need like a crew to do it. So just um, like know what you're, know, like be, be careful what you wish for because you just might, you just might get it. 
Um, yeah. And Jake, as far as you like, as, you, as far as your lawn, like how long does it take you? How much time do you think when you're when you're in the in this the the, the thick of the mowing season and you're really going hard, you're you know you're trying to get the lawn looking nice. How often, like how much time are you spending in the lawn? Like how often? How many days per week? Uh, well, that depends. If I'm especially when on years where I decide to spoon feed, like in the there's there's some summers where I'll hop off my plan for a little bit and I'll spoon feed weekly with the uh, next products like the biostimulant pack. Sure. So I typically spend about two days a week out there mowing. I mow twice a week, sun every Sunday and Wednesday it gets done. And then in between that, I get in there every other week with uh, some uh, with some biostimulants and I just spray away. So I'd say about maybe three to four days out of the entire week I spend out there. Sure. And, I got to spend more time on my landscape though, because I got weeds because I get a lot of, of weeds growing through there up the wazoo. It's just bad. Yeah, well, you and me both. I, 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 that's part. I love mowing grass. I hate doing landscaping. I don't like. I don't I like. Hate you, it too. You, you look at all my beds; they're all mulch for a reason. Like I, like I hate doing shrub because it's just so, it's so much work, and I just I just don't enjoy it. So I know I should I like do more. The way it looks. <laughs> it, it does look nice. It does look nice, but just not. You know, it's just too yeah, much for me. Good. Too much work. All right, let's see. So SMK is chiming in. SM, and, and for those of you guys that know, SMK is a, um, he told me exactly what he does, but pretty much he's a research scientist that looks at how herbicides and products, um, like how they interact with the environment. So he knows a lot about like what mixes well with what. And he's chiming in here. He's saying, hey, liquid pre and post emergence can be applied together only if they mix well. For example, prodiamine, uh, cysamine, and monument all play well together for Bermuda. Triplet SF and Dimension also work well um, for full control. So there you go. So if you're looking for a concoction that works, there's the guy uh, that would know that. So uh, thank you, SMK. I always appreciate your help. And again, I, I'm I am going to get you back on the stream again. I'm going to I'm going to get some really really tough hard herbicide questions for you when I when I have this all queued up and we'll get you back on the show. Hey guys, if you guys are enjoying having Jake on, he's taking some time out of his out of his Friday evening. I mean, he's a young guy. He could be out on the town right now, but no, he's out here hanging out with us answering these long questions. Be sure to hit the like That's button right. if you if if you guys are all, have not um subscribed to Jake's channel or not looking at his content, be sure to do that as well too. You know, definitely show support for the guys that are putting taking the time out to put together um a lot of uh, of this content. Uh let's see. So Ray chimes in a little bit more. He says, also, I want to start getting into real mowing, but I don't know where to start. So um, I, so Jay, so Ray, with an acre, what I would say is let's pick a small portion of your lawn. Let's, let's take the front front lawn, right? Because everyone's going to see that. that that's going to be like the area you're going to see when you drive up. It's like a smaller area of your lawn. And if we're going to go for real mowing, let's go with that. And again, I have no idea how that acre is broken out. I mean, the, your, the, the entire front lawn could be an acre, right? But let's say, let's, let's say for argument's sake, it's a couple thousand square feet. That is the area that I would say let's let's go through. We can top dress it. We can you know if you if you're gonna go with a with a real mower, you gotta decide on which kind of real mower you're gonna go with first, um, and then pick a small area. You know, do that and see if it's for you. I mean, I, I can tell you that you're not gonna want a real mow an acre unless you're gonna spend a lot of unless you're gonna buy like a like a um, a triplex, like kind of something what Connor Ward has. Something you need some serious hardware to real mow uh, an acre, uh, and even then, I don't know that it's that I'd I'd really do that. Um, but yeah, I mean, if if you um. If you want some more some some help on like picking out a mower, and uh, if you want to if you need some more details, feel free to drop me an email here. Sorry, right here, come around my face, right there, uh, Ron at golfcourselawn.com. Send me some pictures or let me know how big your front lawn is, and we can kind of come up with a plan of action um, that makes sense for what you're doing. So I want you to be successful with it. I don't, but at the same time, you know, it's very easy um, to get into real mowing and think that it's going to be, you know, it's going to be all pie in the sky, but there's a lot that there's a lot that goes into doing that um and a lot of it's just a time commitment. So so, so shoot me an email if you, if you don't mind and we can we can talk through a little bit more. But uh but great great uh question. Great question. So um so Jake, as far as you I'm talking about real mowers, as far as you like what do you where do you, what kind of mower are you rocking? Are you running like a Toro or um Honda? What's what's your what's your weapon of choice? That's that's hard for me to answer because right now I'm rocking 10 of them. 10, 10 mowers? See, okay, so all you guys that give me a hard time about having two real mowers, this man has 10. So I don't want to hear anything. So so you have 10 lawn mowers? <laughs> yeah, so the last year I reached out to Snapper and Toro. Uh, right. Snapper Simplicity folks and Toro, they're all part of that Briggs & Stratton uh, company. I reached sure. out to both of them at GIE with Alan and we got surprising results from that. They both wanted to play ball and they gave us a lot of units to review graciously. So yeah, now I got 10 mowers and six snowblowers. Oh, wow. <laughs> that's, that's insane. Do you have any, um, like the zero turn? I always call them the battle cruiser mowers, like any of the, any of the ride-ons or they all push or what did you end up with? 
So I ended up with, uh, for the most part, push mowers and zero mm-hmm. turns. And, and I got to say, the zero turns, the, uh, as far as residential goes, the time cutter, that's my go-to. And as far as push mowers go, I love, I love the Time Master and the Matte Black. Yeah, that's you and Alan both like that. He always he's he's a big fan of the Time Master. And there's another one, the um, there is the Recycler. He likes that one too. Uh, yeah, the Matt. I gotta say though, the Matt Black is definitely up there in one of my favorites. Not just because the color scheme, but it's it's a beautiful mower. It does so well. Yep. Yep. Uh, <laughs> yeah. So Jake, let me let's 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 see what else we have here. So we have another um, uh, point. Yeah. So um, Jay Pompano chimes in. He says. Uh, yeah. Hey, uh, I would, um, you know, if you have a feeling that PGRs are less it for, for cool seasoners, just to, um, just for due, due to it being the, uh, the height of cut, I'm dealing with a, a viewer here that's putting in, that's, 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 um, um, putting trash in the, in the, in the comments. I'm just distracted a little bit because I have a feeling that cool season grass are less into PGRs just due to our climate, um, cool and heat waves and, and that kind of thing. So yeah, that, I, I can definitely see that. Um, I can definitely see that. Uh, Jay. So um, great, great points. Let's see what else we have here. So Higgy Pop says, um, I, I can't afford a real mower. What mowers would you recommend for, for Bermuda grass? So the question, an- the person to answer that is Jay. Jay. So Jay, let's say, okay, so you're out of, a, out of the mowers that you, or for someone that's not going to go for real mowing and you're going to, um, you're going to mow it, say two inches, because that's what Higgy Pop's probably going to be at with a push mower. Um, what would you, out of those two, if you're going to recommend to somebody, um, let's say we're going to say a uh, $500 range. Which, which one are you, which one are you, are you going with? I would definitely say you can, you can get, re- you can do really good with that matte black, uh, Toro recycler, uh, Toro super recycler. They have a couple different versions you can get, uh, some that actually go above that with the Honda engine, one that's right down there in the middle with the actual Toro engine on there. So you get that cool, nice black look on it. And not only that, you get a beautiful cut with it as well. Um, and, but if that's not your ball game, that's totally fine. You're just looking for something that's affordable. They also have one with a regs bridge, Str- brig Stratton on it. That one is a uh, brig Stratton engine. I should say that's a beautiful one too. Um, and as far as going lower than that, they also got really great recycler motors you can get as well. So Toro recyclers are the way to go for anybody that's starting out. And gotcha. then over time you can build up. <laughs> Every time you can, so you can start with a recycler, and then you can buy more. So, you get, so, 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 so just one um, would not, is not enough. You're gonna, you're gonna eventually need more, huh? Yep, All right, just one, one more a year. Just one more, one more <laughs> per year. Well, I, I have two, and I'm, I'm pretty good. I don't think I can. I, one, I don't have any, I don't have any space as far as, um, I don't have space as far as like uh, for, for adding any more, any more mowers. Okay, so Michael, oh, uh, uh, <laughs> Michael Harmer says. Is the yearly maximum a rule or regulation, or is it the max the soil can handle? Um, Michael, is that in regards to PGR, or is that in regards to prodiamine? Um, if it's if it's regards to PGR, um, it's just here's the thing: any like 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 anything else, right? Water is healthy for you or me. You know, drinking water is good for you, but too much of it can become toxic. It's the same thing with most of these, um, but like even herbicides or PGR. Like uh, up to a certain point, they work very well. They can they keep they kill the or, or suppress the undesirable plants that we don't want. But um, if you allow them to run rampant, if you do too much of it, they become toxic and can actually kill or harm the grass. So uh, whenever a manufacturer says, um, you know, don't um, don't exceed, uh, you know, a a a yearly maximum, a a certain in some cases for some products, it'll be like X number of ounces um, per thousand square feet per year. Like you really don't you really don't want to do that. And really, if you're talking about like, say, pre-emergent. There's really no need to, to, to go over that. Like, so good example, like prodiamine, um, there's so many other pre-emergents you can use. You can use uh, dithiopyr, you've got like uh, pendulum. There's a couple other ones you can use that um, that will do a great job. So there's no reason to only stick with one and go excessively heavy um, on that. Uh, let's see. So, you know, one thing I, I, I see too, Jake, is a good question for you, is um, so... Oh, annual overseeding. I see like a lot of guys always talk about overseeding um cool season lawns. Is that kind of par for the course? Like every year you guys are just, are you pretty much overseeding to fill up thin areas or like, what is that about as far as um, people always uh, seeding their lawns? You see, this is, this is actually a really interesting question because I've never heard of this. And it might be because when we get into winter, we typically go to sleep, especially with where we're at here in Northwest Indiana, Chicago area. We go to sleep around September, and after that, that's when we get snow for a good month, and then things wake back up in March. So 
I think the annual overseeding thing, I don't think that's much of a cool season thing. It might be on the golf courses during the spring and summer, maybe. Okay. But what I think he's talking about is he might be talking about annual overseeding for ryegrass on Bermuda. Maybe okay. I'm maybe maybe that's what he's talking about. Because I see a lot of people doing that. Yeah, ryegrass looks really great on Bermuda uh in the winter. It's a great winter coat, if you will. Right. Yeah. So I think it's Alexander. He says, I'm I'm still learning about um perennial ryegrass, trying to find um, oh, he's talking about PGR. He says, I'm trying, I'm still trying to learn about PGR, oh, okay. trying to find the right, the right rate. Okay. So, um, Alexander, I can help with that. So as far as, um, PGR goes, um, and kind of like herbicides, like, here's the thing, hear me on this, please. If you listen to nothing else I say, um, listen to this. When it comes to PGR, more is not better. Like literally the rate that they, that is put on the label, you need to follow that to the law. If anything, a little bit less. So as a general rule for warm season grass, um, an application rate of 0.25 ounces per thousand square feet um, is going to work just fine. If you have like Tifway 419, uh, you can go up to 0.38, 0.4, somewhere in that in that space. Um, but the way I always look at it is, uh, if you want to make the math simple, is if you have a four gallon backpack sprayer and you are applying the product at a rate of one gallon of product per thousand square feet, like you've got your sprayer all calibrated, you know what your walking pace needs to be to put down one gallon of product over a thousand square feet, you're going to put down, you're going to mix one ounce. So four times, you know, because it's so four gallons covers 4,000 square feet, 0.25 times four, one ounce. So you're going to put one ounce of Teenex in with four gallons of water. So if you have a four gallon backpack sprayer, one ounce of Teenex to um, a four gallon backpack sprayer is a good, is a good safe um, number as far as PGR goes. And I've got some content on that. If you, if you search the channel on applying PGR, I've got like a video, it's like 20 minutes long. It's uh, probably longer than I, than I should have uh, made it all, all about PGR, like all about the different types and how to apply it and all this stuff. So um, check that out if you've not um, if you've not, uh, not done that as <laughs> as yet. Uh, let's see if you need other any other questions in the chat, feel free to um, to, to snatch them. And then uh, let's see. So wind chariot is is uh, talking about says uh, SMK after overseeding and new seed is established. Would you suggest prodiamine, a size mean application? I'm not sure what, if SMK has chimed in on that, um, but here's a here's the thing. When chariot is if you're putting new seed down, the, hey, the way the way that prodiamine works, the um, like not all peters work this way, but the way prodiamine in particular works is that it stunts root growth, right? So it's going to, it, you heard this term root clipping, um, prodiamine does that. So whenever a weed seed tries to germinate and it's trying to put a little, it's it's uh, it's it's roots out to try and, you know, tr getting nutrients and growing, like um, prodiamine suppress suppresses that from happening. So even if you have new seeds, so let's say you applied, you seeded in say May, right? And then you wanted to go put down prodiamine, I wouldn't, I, I personally would not, um, I wouldn't, I would not use any pre-emergent for really six months, three, you know, at, at a minimum, at a minimum three months, but really more like six months until after you've, you've, um, you've, the turf is established because you just, you just don't want to take the chance of hurting that. I mean, Bermuda is a bit of an exception in the sense that like Bermuda is, is probably going to tolerate it better than, um, than most other grass types. But I just, you know, I, it's not like if I put down, you, you seeded this month and the next month I would not apply any kind of pre-emergent. You, you could, you could, um, you're going to, you're going to materially slow down how, how strong the, or how quickly the turf get, um, improves in strength. What about you, Jake? Have you, what about you when it comes to, see, whenever you've done seeding, have you um, uh, put prodiamine or put any kind of pre-emergent down right afterwards or what's your, your, your take on that? So right at the beginning, I have to make that decision whether I'm going to do one or the other. So when I just make the decision to say seed, I just go full seed and I don't, I leave the pre-emergent out of it till next year. Sure. Yeah. Yeah. So I agree. So I mean, it, to me, it's like you pick, you pick your poison. It's like one or the other. You can't have, uh, you, I hate to say it, but you can't really have a, a completely weed free lawn easily and also get seeds. So it's like you pay to pick one or the other. Um, and Absolutely. in my case, because how, as expensive as seed is, I wouldn't want to put any kind of herbicides down or anything that's going to materially affect how well the uh, this the seed the seed does. Uh, uh, Jake, so you got a question here from Nick's Nation. He says, uh, hey Jake, I'm in Northern Virginia. Do you recommend me killing my entire lawn in March? Yeah, I actually saw this one. Nick's Na Nation, this is a really great question. And this goes back to what I talk about a lot. So when it comes to whether or not you should kill your lawn, I would just say this. Examine your situation. See if you have any good, viable turf in there. Sure. Uh, based on what you're telling me here in the comments, I actually did have a little bit of a conversation with him in here. He okay. told me that he, he's seeing 
a blanket of mostly weed. So what I would okay. suggest to uh, you, um, Nick's Nation, is maybe get out there as soon as temperatures get warm and those weeds come up, which is typically around Derby Day, Derby Day, mm-hmm. early May, I like to say. Um, get out there with a three-way um, spot spray where you see weeds, not where you don't. According to what you're telling me, you might want to do a blanket post-emergent on that. And then after that, see what viable turf's in there that you could save. And if you can't save it, I recommend you do a fall over seeding or fall seeding in that case. Cool. Great. Awesome. Awesome question. Awesome answer. There you go. All right. So uh, this is one for me, I think. So JS uh, Mac, Mad Max says, if you plan to aerate and top dress, do you uh, do you put pre-emergent before or after? Um, so yeah, so aerating and top dressing, if, if all you're doing is that, I would, I would still, because you're going to be doing um, top dressing in May, let's say, again, I'm, saying, I'm assuming you're in Georgia, um, I would still apply pre-emergent um, at your normal time. So it, yes, you are, by aerating the lawn, by doing like holotine aeration, you are disrupting that barrier that you put down with the, um, that you got from the pre-emergent. So you are going to like reduce the effectiveness of it somewhat. But um, if you think about it, we're not going to be top dressing until May or June. And if you don't have any kind of pre-emergent down, once March, April hits and those temps start coming up, like all the spring weeds are going to start be, you know, showing themselves. Um, so I, I would apply, if, even if all you're doing is top dressing, so you're not doing any kind of seeding, I would do pre-emergent on your normal schedule. It's going, it's not going to have as long of an effectiveness period because you are, again, you are disrupting that barrier. But if it's just, if it's just top dressing and, um, and, 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 uh, and, aerating, then in that case, uh, you would not, you know, you, I, I wouldn't change a thing at all. So hopefully that helps. Um, JSD max. That's a good, um, that's a good question. So let's see here. So we have a quick question. Yeah. Yeah. So, so just, so, so in other words, it's only when you're seeding or if you're establishing, you put down fresh sod or you're establishing new turf, that is when you want to be careful with applying pre-emergent because it can stunt or, or harm, um, the ability of new sod to, to to really do well. Again, with Bermuda, it is in many ways less so because Bermuda is very hardy. Like Bermuda is going to put up with a lot, but as, as a general practice, you want to get you want to let the lawn, um, you know, grow in. If you put if you put fresh sod in, give it six months and then um, apply your pre-emergent. Again, you're, you're, if you're putting sod in or you're putting seed in, you're going through a renovation, so just kind of surrender that year, surrender that season or part of that season to give the stuff that you are spending money on the best chance to do well. That would be my recommendation. Uh, let's see here. So, um, Richard Nettles, that's a good question here. It says negate, you have to use the embo- entire bottle in a single app. Um, yes, you, you, you should. So if you get online, you'll see people that will take it and they'll, they'll take a spoon of it and they'll, um, you know, a teaspoon, they'll try and mix it. But really, yes, negate is designed to be used all at once. So, um, the, the instructions, I believe say that they, they, they recommend mixing it with a gallon. So if you have like, I think I got one, like, okay, like a tipping pour. This is not a gallon one, but I can show you here. This is a, a small one. So this is a, a tip and pour and you would, you would fill, this is not a gallon. This is a, I think this is a half gallon. Um, but anyway, you take one of these guys and you would put a gallon of water in it. So 128 ounces and then empty the entire bottle get to the center of negate in. And then this is like your, your intermediate mix. Right, and then you can use the this this uh, the scale here. If I can get to focus, come on, Sony autofocus, don't fail me now. There we go. Um, you can use this to measure out how many ounces of it um, you need for spot spraying. So, if you put down a if you make a gallon intermediate mix, the rate for spot spraying is going to be three ounces of this of this mix this mixture with um, one gallon of water. So let's say you want to you want to do two thousand square feet worth of um of spot spray mix you would use two gallons of water and then six ounces of that blend so so again yes you do have to use it all and um per the instructions it's it's gonna it's gonna last about a month they say um and i i I did ask like what's the way to dispose of it like you could take it to some places and get it disposed of um uh, but they say that you know if you if you once a month passes you can pour it out like near the foundation of your house. Like don't don't pour it near any drains or anything obviously like that, but like pouring it next to your house, like right near the foundation where it's not gonna really go anywhere is, is an option. But really that mixture is only good for a month because a um, a small bottle of negate is designed to treat an acre, right? So I, I've also heard of some people using a more concentrated intermediate mix where some people will say, instead of doing a gallon, do uh, 43, um, 43 ounces, 44 ounces. You figure like an acre is say between 43 and 40,000 square feet. Um, 44,000 square feet. So if you do 44 ounces of water and then negate, then you can do a one for one, so like one ounce per 1,000 square feet. 
But to give yourself a little bit of headroom um, and to make and just to just dilute it a little bit more, do a gallon. So a gallon in like a tip and pour. So like get like a gallon tip and pour. Um, and it makes sure there's a gallon of water in it, 128 ounces, the entire bottle goes in, and then three ounces per thousand is how you would use it for spot spraying. So hopefully that helps Richard. And the gate's not that expensive. Um, that's that's the nice thing about it. I'll, I'll um I'll throw a link in here in case you decide you want to go through and do that. But it's but yeah, you you want to you want to do it the right way because there's two there's two separate prills. There's two separate um, um, prills in that in that container. So it's really hard if you're just kind of taking it out with a spoon, which is what some people do, but you're really not supposed to do, to ensure that you're getting um, even coverage. So just uh, just something to um, to consider. Um, let's see. So so what about so I guess um, uh, Jake for you for when it comes to um, post emergent herbicides on cool season grass what is your go-to like what do you which which one do you like to use for a post-emergent herbicide okay great question so i think for any beginner out there it's a good idea to go to the store and see what they have like home depot or menards for instance one of my favorites uh brands that they have over there is bio advanced they sell the typical three-way uh like the 24d the dicamba and the concorac mm -hmm. that mixture together that will pretty much take care of all the weeds you're dealing with right out the gate but for those who want to get a little more advanced, you want a little more concentration, I understand you. I got you. Um, I recommend Speed Zone. Speed Zone okay. is a really, really good broadleaf weed control for dandelions or anything along that nature with uh, weeds. And then as far as crabgrass, just granular conchlorac. WDG, okay. I think it is. Yeah. Or, yeah, DF. So, so, so conchlorac. Okay. Now, I've heard about another, another one called... Um, uh, blind side. Have you ever played with that one? Have you ever used that one? No, I think I believe it's safe for both cool season and warm season grass. Have you ever heard of using that one? I, I have not. I have not played with that one. No. Okay. So okay, but there you go. That. But 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 it sounds like a lot of the ones that you that Jake's recommending are things you can either find at your big box store, um, or if you want to go with the, the Quinclorac, you know, that just step it up a little bit. But it sounds like there's a lot of really good um, and easy options uh, for getting rid of um, of weeds in your lawn. Uh, let's see. So I think this, this is one probably one for you, Jake. It's a good one. It says, hey, uh, Jake, the lawn kid and Ron, you all mentioned clover and spurge earlier. What's your best trick for taking care of those types of weeds? So Jake, I'll, I'll let you go first. So, so clover, how do you how do you get rid of clover? So I just spray I just spray clover with the typical three way and get over the, at the big box store. That works just fine. And on top of that, one little bonus I like to do is put in some dish soap at one ounce per gallon of mix. Okay. That's going to act as a nice little affordable surfactant, if you will, if you can't get your hands on that. And it'll take care of it within a couple of weeks, two, three weeks to be exact. Sure. Cool. Yeah. And then for, for Spurge, um, there's a couple of different options. You can use uh, Certainty is an option. I think Spurge certainty will teach what will do Spurge. One concoction I did last year, um, and it's kind of harsh, but it definitely works, is um, Speed Zone and Dismiss. Now, here's the thing. If you do this on Bermuda, it's or any grass really, it's going to temporarily, um, it's going to give you a little bit of yellowing. It's, I mean, Bermuda is nice and it's going to bounce back relatively quickly. Like in a, 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 about ten days later, you couldn't tell that anything was really sprayed on the lawn. But dismiss and speed zone. If you're dealing with like a really heavy spurge outbreak and you want to knock, you want to get rid of the spurge, like smoke it out. Like that concoction uh, works well. Like that was one app and it was gone. It never, it, it didn't, didn't come back again. Um, Another option, if you're looking for some stuff that you could use from, you know, without having to use something you have to put in a backpack spare a little bit or heavy, I've had good good success with treating Spurge using the um, the Weed Stop product, that stuff that you get um, at Home Depot, the that's got the the it has got the the blend. The only thing about that, the only thing about that, that you you must do is you have to ensure that the the plant is wet. So you, the time to apply it is like in the morning. Um, when there's dew on, on the spurge. And if you, if you, if you lay that on it, that can work too. It's going to be slower. Um, but that's, that's an option if you're not trying to do, um, some of the more professional grade, um, herbicides, but dismiss, if you want one that's definitely going to work, dismiss and speed zone will, uh, will, uh, will absolutely get it done. Absolutely get it done. All right. Uh, so let's see. So we have a question here from Michael Harmer. He says, Hey Ron, I think you said it earlier, but what, I was busy. But when should I air at my lawn? I was thinking sometime next month. Um, so here's the thing, um, Michael. The the uh, traditional guidance will say aerate your lawn whenever it is actively growing. So really, April, May, late April, May is, is like the traditional time to do it. I've done it as early as March, and I've done it at the time when they say you're supposed to do it, and I've had good results with both. So um, I I would say wait till like April, May if you if you want. Uh, that's that's the if especially if it's your first time doing it. Um, that is going to a couple a couple reasons why that's better. 
uh, the turf is going to recover faster. So if you do it in April, May, it's going to just bounce back faster. The Bermuda is going to is, is actively growing. It's going to come. It's going to um, recover from the aeration um, a lot faster. If you do it in, in March, the reason why I tried it one time in March is like you know I was putting down my my fertilizer to kind of wick the turf up, like my, my spring my spring fur to kind of jump start things. And I thought, hey, you know why not aerate and really get you know kind of fast track getting this into the soil and making it more available to plant. And I did that and I had a good result. So either one can work. Traditional guidance will say April, May, but um, I, I've done it as as um, as early as March, and I've I've had um, some decent results too. All right, uh, let's see. So Jake, I think they got a question for you. He says, "Hey, Jake, just started watching you. Great videos and content. I'm sure he's gonna like to hear that." He says, "What uh, type of grass do you have, and what's your favorite type?" Well, first off, Papa Mose, thank you. I was just chatting with you a couple of minutes ago. Um, I would like to tell you that my favorite grass type is Kentucky bluegrass, right? Only the finest of turf connoisseurs would know that Kentucky bluegrass, there's just something about it. It's soft, it's double dark green, and it stripes well. So to answer your question, oh, KBG. KBG. For, for, for cool season grass, right? But I mean, we're, we're yeah. talking about like, you know, the the master, the, the, the grass to end all grass it. Probably has to be Bermuda, right? But I uh, know, but but oh, but I agree. <laughs> no, but, but I, I I agree with you. As far as the one thing I will say for you for you cool season guys, as far as stripes, like Kentucky bluegrass or right, man, like on a on a really good day, I can lay some decent stripes for Bermuda. But Kentucky bluegrass <laughs> or rye, just it's 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 like cheat mode is what it is. It's really like cheating. You watch like um, Ryan or any of those guys if you real mow um, KBG or rye, it looks incredible. Uh, whenever you uh, whenever you lay lay some stripes on it, so I I, I totally Absolutely. get it. And okay, so John Gotch has a question here. He says, uh, Ron, what app uh, are you ordering uh, this Arden fifteen uh, this twenty five pound of Arden fifteen? Amazon only have eight pounds. Okay, great. So so John, I'll probably be getting it um, from Hancock. So this I actually called them two days ago, and they don't have it as yet. So in, in a, probably in a few weeks uh, is when it'll it'll show up on Amazon um, and their website. So you'll be able to get it either on Amazon or you can go to Hancock Seed and get it there. Um, but it'll it'll pop up there eventually, and that's when I'll, I'll pick it up. So I, I'm going to be getting it from from um, from Amazon or from them. I'll just look and see whichever who's got the better price and um, and and go that way. But but to your point, you are right. There is an R15 that's up now. A company called Outside Pride that sells it has some up, but that's in smaller smaller packets. If you want like 25 pounds. Um, you're probably going to have to get that from Hancock. And that's, again, I called them a couple days ago and they said it's going to be a few weeks um, when until that uh, that that pops in. Until that pops in. All right, let's see what other uh, questions here. So Wind Char so um, SMK is kind of uh, backing me up on this one really good. He says, at Wind Chariot, no herbicide should be applied to baby grass until it's established. But I mean prunes roots, so definitely a no-no. Um, Semizine isn't safe on new turf either. So there you go. Pretty, pretty much any of the sides. Also, I mean, what, what could you get away with with new turf? You could get away with a probably a fungicide and insecticide. Pretty much stuff that's not designed to, to kill weeds, like kill grass. You could get away with those. But I wouldn't put in, I wouldn't put a post or pre-emergent on on new grass, especially Bermuda, because if you're doing like seed, it's expensive. Like it's just really expensive to do, and you just don't want to take the chance of um of hurting that grass. You just put all that um all that that money into you know so thanks for uh, for chiming in smk uh i thought that was the, the right answer that but i'm glad to also hear that you you concur as as well and uh yeah uh, uh, michael harmer says i was talking about pre-emergent but i thought i got that in the comment but i guess i didn't i have to go back up and see exactly what you were um referring to i'll just go back up and see if i can find it um, here's a question, um, probably for you, Jake, you can, you can chime in on this one. It says, Ron or Jake, have y'all thought about going electric reel mowing or in your case, electric rotary? What yeah, say you? Another great question. So Alexander, I am, like I said, I am in the middle of a collaboration with the Toro folks, long-term collaboration. Hopefully I love those guys. And one of the things I would like to do in 2021 is maybe for just my own lawn, is just go all battery with everything, mowing, trimming, edging, all of that, and just see how it goes for a whole season. So it might be some fun content to look forward to, Alexander. Very cool. Yeah. Now, and as far as electric reel mowing, uh, the only one that I've seen in person, I've seen like Swordman, um, Lee and the guys at Real Rollers, they have a Swordman that, uh, like an Edwin that's electric. Um, I've not had a chance to try it out to know how it would work. Um, I know that like the the Greensmaster, getting electric Greensmaster 
is pretty expensive. I, I'd be open to trying one out. If Toro wants to wants to send me one to try out, I absolutely would would um would would take them up on it. Um, but it's it's not something. I mean, they're they're very they're very expensive to get, and I, I haven't really seen that many electric ones in the used market. Um, so so the, yeah, and the thing is, a lot of my equipment, like for me, um, most of my stuff is actually all of my stuff is all gas powered. Like my um my steel combi systems with my edger blower. Um, hedge trimmer, all that stuff is all gas. So I, I still probably have to deal with gas anyways. So there's, there's less of, um, uh, you know, of motivation for me to go, to go all electric. I still have some gas, um, I'm laying around, but I get it. I mean, like some of the, some of the new electric stuff is really, really good. Like the, um, the Toro stuff. Um, there's another brand, uh, is it the ego brand? Like the, a lot of people seem to, seem to really like their electric stuff, their electric equipment. Yep. Um, cool. Yeah. So it just, just, just depends on what you're after and what, and what you're trying to do. If you're trying to, if you're completely getting rid of gas, makes sense. But if you're going to be mixing gas and electric, eh, it's, there's less of less, less benefit to it. All right. Let's see what Robert Riley says here. He says, I got, a, I have a shiny um, looking layer, black layer under my grass of, of my soil in a, in a shady area under my patio cover. The Bermuda is thin there. I install rain gutters and drains to try to solve this problem. Can I kill? I don't see, I didn't see the rest of the question. Um, I didn't see the rest of the question, but um, but here's here's the issue. It sounds like you're dealing with, the, the thing you're dealing with is shade, right? So um, Robert Riley, when it comes to Bermuda, it comes to all grass really, but especially Bermuda, like like sunlight is is like is critical to Bermuda doing well. Like I, I, again, I, if you guys have, have watched the um, the content, I've done a couple of videos here recently on the importance of like minimizing shade on Bermuda. Like Bermuda needs a solid six to seven hours. I mean, really even a little bit more of direct sunlight. When we say direct, here's what direct means. Direct means not passing through trees, not passing through shrubs. It's like just sh like sun, grass. Um, outside of that, you are going to, it's, it's not going to be as healthy. It's going to be a little bit thinner. So what you're dealing with here, it sounds like you said it's, it's, um, it's a thin layer of grass under a shady area under your patio. Uh, unless you can, can you, I'm not sure if you can send me some pictures of it, um, Robert, um, uh, but to, to see exactly what you're dealing with, but like any kind of shade is going to be a problem for Bermuda. It's just, it's just not of all the grass types. It is like probably the worst, one of the worst ones when it comes um, to shade. Zoysia does a little bit better, but again, depending on what, how much shade we're dealing with, even Zoysia, uh, wouldn't, um, wouldn't work too well. So, uh, so yeah, I'm, I'm sorry to have to give you bad advice. I don't want you to, here's the thing. I don't want you to go out and spend a bunch of money on installing gutters and drainage and doing a lot of things to try and eliminate the, the, you know, drainage issue, which again, is important. You want, you don't want like water sitting or staying on the turf, but like all that stuff, none of that stuff is going to matter if it's not getting enough sunlight. Like you got like sunlight is like, that's again, like, Soil pH and macronutrients, all this stuff is really good, but the sunlight, sunlight is literally the engine that powers all this stuff, you know? That's why grass doesn't really grow that much at night. It grows during the daytime when the sun is really hitting it. It needs sunlight. Um, so, uh, so yeah, but yeah, feel free to email me if you have any, if you have any other questions. I mean, I, I'll look for your email. Um, my email address is right here. It's hard to do with me, just be on the screen. So Ron at golfforcelawn.com. Feel free to drop me a line and we can talk about it some more, but, um, I don't want you to go out and spend a bunch of money on, on uh, drainage and all this other stuff, hoping that it's going to fix the problem when I don't, I don't think it, it, it will, if you're not getting enough sunlight. All right. So, um, we have, um, um, Eel Ovaris, 1976. He says, Hey, I live in Southern California. Uh, lucky you. And he says, and the weather is warming up. Uh, soil temp is above 55. I renovated the lawn in December and threw down more seed in the bare spots in January recommendations for post emergence tall fescue okay so we were do we were doing really really well until you said the seed you just threw down in january i'm i'm not going to i i'm not going to tell you to put any kind of post emergent down on um on new seed uh so uh, let's let's say this if say we we erase the new seed jake as far as a post emergent for tall fescue um is the same ones that you recommend like what would you what would you say to go with um for him so for tall fescue, it's nothing special. It's the same thing. Okay. The same, same, same thing th you would do for bluegrass or rye. Yeah. No so issues the same, there. So the same, same products, same products he mentioned before. Okay. Um, yep. but yeah, so the, so, uh, I would not personally, if you just put down, if you just, you know, put seed down in the burst spots in January, we like, we're just, we're just now out of January. Yeah, no I mean, herbicides, man, no post-emergent, no pre-emergent. Like I wouldn't do any of that stuff. Let it grow. Yeah. Let it grow. Like literally, if you, if you want like uh tall, tall fescues, you do it in January. If April, May-ish, 
if you if you really want to spot spray with like post immersion on against some weeds, you might you might want to consider it then. But right now, absolutely not. I mean, you just you put all this money and time into it. Um, you don't want to you don't want to hurt the uh, the new grass because here's the thing people don't realize, right? Even when you look at a lot of these herbicides, like you know you you'll see and they'll say it's safe for this type of grass, right? Like you look at like um, like spectricide or or blindside or any of these other ones, right? That are safe for like say warm season grass. Yes, what, what safe for warm season grass means that it's not going to kill it. It's not going to like smoke it out like like glyphosate will, but it's still going to it still stresses the turf, right? It's not like like this stuff is so selective that it will kill the weed and do no, and the Bermuda just isn't phased at all by it. It just means that it's not going to materially kill the Bermuda off if applied at the right rate. So, with you putting down like having fresh grass, like new turf being established, uh, you know. Any kind of herbicide you put down is going to hurt that that new seed that you just spent all that money and time um, putting in. So it just that that's the reason why uh, you know we're, we're both of us are saying uh, no herbicides uh, right now. No herbicides right now. I just I just wouldn't do it. I think it's only only bad things will, will come out of that. Just deal with the weeds for now and summertime if you want to go for it, fine. But not not right now. All right. <clears throat> So Nate Moore comes in. He says, "Hey, is there any? Are there any negatives to watering the lawn immediately after a mow? Should you wait a day or so, or, or are you good to go right after the mow for watering?" Um, I I typically I can tell you what I say, and then Jake, I'll let you chime in. As far as watering, I, I I don't really run irrigation during. I tend to not run irrigation during the daytime unless I'm trying to specifically water like a fertilizer in or water some kind of product I just put down in. Other than that, I have my irrigation set to run at 4 a.m. So I have mine run, run super early in the morning. So it, it get, get down all the, you know, the wind's going to be lowest. I get a good soaking. And then when the sun comes up, it's going to, you know, the, the turf will begin to dry out. Um, but I, I, there's there's not really any negatives, Nate. There's not really any negatives to doing it. I mean, you don't want to be, if you're mowing in the middle of the day and you're watering, you don't want to be putting the water down when it's going to be evaporating really quickly. So you're not going to get as much benefit out of it. But as far as hurting things, no, it's not going to. But uh, but Jake, what are your thoughts as far as watering after a mow or like like when you water your lawn? When do you when do you do it? Yeah, I like to water in the morning too. My biggest thing with uh, watering in the evening is fungus, especially with where I live. If we get a, if we get a humid summer, fungus is a concern. So for the most part, I would say water in the morning, water deep and infrequent, and mm -hmm. spread it out about three or four days out of the week, and you should be good. Yep. Yep. Great advice. Great, uh, great advice there. Yeah. So early, early morning is the way to go again, unless you are trying to water in some particular product that you're putting down. Um, but, but to answer your question, no, you're not going to hurt anything. It's just, you're just kind of wasting water to an extent. Yeah. All right. So static alpha question about real mowers. He says last year I bought my first real mower. Congratulations. Congrats. So he's got the California trimmer. I love the thing. However, I don't know much about maintenance. What do you recommend so it runs sharp for many years. So here, here's part of the things with real mowers. Um, and really true for rotaries too. As far, if you are using the real mower, it's not going to stay sharp for years. I mean, at at um, at best, you're going to get a season out of a out of a grind. And that's and that's if you're only cutting grass with this. If you're being very disciplined, you're not cutting twigs, you're not cutting so low that you're getting, you're not scalping with it, you're not getting into like into the the the, the soil, and you're only cutting grass, you can you can get a season um, thereabouts with out of a sharpening. Um, so static alpha, as far as your trimmer, I would recommend, um, you know, just, just annually. So, so what I would do is the beginning of the season, let's say you're going to scalp. I'm assuming you've got a warm season grass. I'm not sure what you're dealing with, but let's say, let's say you're going to, you're going to scalp the, um, the lawn here in March or whatever. Right. And you don't have another mower to do it with. If you have another mower like a rotary, that's what I would use to actually scalp. But if you don't have that and you're going to use your real mower to scalp, do that first. So scalp with the real mower, scalp with the trimmer, because you, you're going to mess up the edge on the reel and the bed knife and it's going to have to get sharpened out anyway. So do that first. And then afterwards, take it in, get it sharpened, and then you should be good to go for the entire, for the rest of the season, assuming you're staying out of out of dirt. But as far as it's staying sharp for many seasons, it's just not, it's just not a thing. I mean, you, you're going to... Um, you know, you don't, just like you don't want to be cutting the grass with a dull rotary, you don't want to be cutting the grass with a dull, uh, reel and bed knife. That, that, that's, that's a very tight tolerance and you want to maintain that for the best possible cut. Um, Jake, what do you say? What do you, as far as like, um, sharpening, like, what do you do? Do you change blades or do you actually sharpen them? What's your take on, on rotaries as far as sharpening? So I just, I, I typically pay attention to the blades once a month at, at, uh, most is when I get them sharpened. One, you said once a month? Yeah. Yeah. See, so there you go. So that so so with rotaries, he's doing it monthly. With a reel, you're doing it. You know, uh, again, if you're if you're being good about it, once once per season. And 
I don't know, what does it cost you to get a rotary blade sharpened? I, I can't imagine it's too expensive. I wouldn't, I wouldn't think. That's a tough one. I wouldn't know. Uh, oh, you, oh, oh, so you it's, for a reg, no, for you, for you. For like, when you, when you sharp, do you sharpen it yourself or do you actually take it to give it to somebody to sharpen it? Oh, no, no. I sharpen them myself. Sorry okay, about that. So, okay, so there you go. So he does it himself. Um, with a real mower, you're not going to do it yourself. You're going to have to pay someone to do it. And um, you're typically looking at around 100 bucks uh, to get that done. So that's that's a, that's another feather in the cap for rotaries in that sharpening is something that you can um, you can easily you can easily do yourself. So we have SMK chiming in here on some other options. He's saying that Monument and MSM Turf is very similar to Negate. It works just as well, and you would say even faster. So as far as options for, for burning out POA in your lawn this time of year, uh, those are um, are good options. And Super TA, TA is talking about Kentucky Bluegrass. He says uh, KBG is the equivalent of Bermuda. If you can't have uh, Bermuda, then Kentucky Bluegrass uh, uh, it is. So yeah, yeah, very, um, very, very cool. Very cool. Let's see. Um, and then as far as um, options for getting your reels sharpened, if you have like a, um, if you have an outlet or uh, sort of like a swordman, like yeah, Real Rollers has a mail-in maintenance program. You can mail it in, they'll sharpen it and get it back to you. So as far as options, if you don't have a place nearby that'll do it, they can uh, they can take care of that for you. So all all really um, all really good stuff. And um, looks like we have some congratulations are in order. To Super TA is talking. He says, hey, he's getting. An Outlet Liberty, nice, very nice. Got to give it up for that. Got to give it up for that. Congratulate, congratulations, uh, Outlet. And uh, this is a good one. I, I have not done this, but this is a good question from Brandon. Where, and you can uh, you can chime on this one, um, uh, Jake, if you've done it. He says, tell me your thoughts on corn gluten as a pre, I guess as he's saying, as a, as a pre-emergent? I've never heard of that being used before. Um, you? No, nope, Jake, not no? really. Can't yeah, speak on it. Yeah, neither can I. Yes, I, I, I'm not sure, um, Brandon, on that one. I've not heard of it. Uh, assuming I'm understanding your question, if it's if it's uh, works as a pre-emergent, um, I've never I've never heard of that. I'll it's, I'll take it as a point of research, but I've uh, I've not heard that one. So this is a cool historical one for you, Jake. Papa Moe's Lowy says, Jake, how did you and Alan originally meet? You looked so young in the video, neighbors. Yeah, so him and I were neighbors for ten years. Um, we've lived in this development for about. 15 years now this subdivision well it's fully developed now but by the time we moved here it was all the houses were still being built alan was next door right before us he moved in the year before and then over time you know my dad and him became friends and i became curious as to what he was doing in the lawn with his cameras when i started getting old enough to realize what was going on right. and then him and i man we we totally hit it off you know he he started teaching me some things and i took it made it my own sauce it was pretty cool nice nice yeah 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 alan's really, good for that man yeah. Yeah, that's cool. Yeah, I remember watching the videos and stuff. It, it was, uh, yeah, you guys, you guys had a good thing going when you guys were doing content together. Really, really cool. Okay, so we have, oh, we, a, we have, sorry, go ahead. I was just saying, we still talk all the time. We got a good relationship still. Nice. Very, very cool. All right, so we got one here from uh, John Gosh. Is Ron and Jake, can you please give a shout out to my grandkids, Jaden and Oakland, who are watching this program with me? I'm starting them young. They were sure. ages seven and four. So Jaden and Oakland, shout out. Um, definitely um, enjoy your granddad. He, he, he is giving you guys a gift. Now, you guys might at your age, at four and seven, when I was your age, mowing the lawn seemed like punishment. But here's the thing. One day, you will get to grow up to be like an old guy. Like, oh, well, not, not old like me, but like Jake's probably old compared to you guys, where you're going to appreciate, you know, taking care of a good lawn. So, do, you know, enjoy the fact that he's spent taking time with you guys and teaching you guys the ropes. Um, and it's, it's fun. It's good, clean fun and it's good exercise. And it's, uh, it, it, it teaches you at a very young age to take pride in something that takes a while to achieve, which, you know, delayed gratification is, is, is a good lesson to learn. Uh, Jake, that's awesome. Shout out yep. to you guys. Yeah. Thank you yep. for all so, your support. We appreciate you. Definitely. Definitely. Awesome. Okay. So we have, um, super TA. He's talking about, um, weeds. And if you're really concerned about weeds in your new grass, you can always use tenacity it will harm your lawn. Apparate is critical, or you will get bleaching. And yeah, so that's so that's a good, that's a good point. Tenacity yeah. is a um, now now correct me if I'm wrong on this one. I believe tenacity is both a pre and a, is it both a pre and post immersion, right? It's one of those herbicides that can do um, both. It's like a selective. It's, a, it's one of the few selective pre emergents I believe. Uh, Jay, yes. Cool yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep. So yeah, yeah but again, um, go ahead. You can get so many different kinds of it. You can get a granular version as well as a 
I believe a liquid version if you went online, but for the most part, what you're going to see when you go to the big box store is granular and mm -hmm. it can be put down with your seed. Yep. And it is yep. pre and post emergent. Yes. Yep. Yeah. So it's a great, it's, it's cool. And it's, it's one of the, one of the few selective ones. So that's kind of, that's a cool, um, you know, cool option for you. Um, Elvarez, if you, if you're looking for something to, uh, to take care of that in your cool season lawn. All right. So, uh, we have a point here about from Alexander Thomas. He's saying PGR lowered uh, my last year water bill. Yeah, that's, that's a good other good point too, because with PGR at least on, on warm season grass, one of the benefits of it is that it causes the turf to get denser. Like the grass, instead of growing up, it starts growing laterally. So with Bermuda, it gets really, really, really dense, which helps um, whenever you you um, you water it, it helps, it keeps the sun away. It helps sh um, shade the soil a little bit, helps it hold onto moisture, which is a benefit of um, of PGR. Um, so yeah, it's, that's that's definitely a, um, a plus side to it. One negative to that though is, right, depending on the height of cut you're at, um, like you can, it can, it can, the turf can get too dense. So that's one thing I started, I started running into towards the end of the season. Um, even at 0.75 with PGR, where the turf was really dense to where the, um, the mower began running kind of on top of the turf on top, on top of the grass, instead of the groove rollers really being able to penetrate in and kind of, you know, comb it and get a good cut. So the one thing with PGR, if you are depending on, again, it's, it's a combination of PGR and also the height of cut you're trying to maintain. Um, as you go lower, uh, verta cutting is something you're going to have to start considering. You know, it's not something I did last year and I, I noticed the results, um, from, from not doing that, but yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, Alexander, as far as, um, it helping to, uh, to lower your, your water bill. Let's see here. Uh, Jamar McKinney says, I found a shop and they want 250 for sharpening. Yeah, that's, that's, that's kind of hot. I mean, for 250, they need to be sharpening it, doing a full service, pressure washing it, like, it needs to be. It just needs to be a lot. That's that's full that's that's, that's at that point. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Full tune up. That's 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 a bit high. That's a bit high. Um, I'm not sure what part of the country you're in, Jamar. If you're in the Atlanta area, um, shoot me an email. I can give you some some advice. I mean, if you're in the Atlanta area, uh, Jerry Pate can do it. If you have a true cut, um, Keyst, uh, um, Keystone Rental can do it. Um, yeah, there's a couple lots of good shops in this area that can that can do um, sharpening on uh, on on real mowers. All right, so Ned G says, Ron and Jake, two of my fraves. Uh, how you guys doing? We're doing well, man. Thank doing you so great. much for, for hang, coming in there. Thanks for hanging out with us. A fellow Indiana guy. A fellow Indiana guy? Oh, so, so you yeah. know him from your channel? Very cool. Yeah, he tries, very, very he tries cool. about my house all the time. He comments. He's like, man, I see your Christmas lights. I see your lawn. I'm like, wow. <laughs> so, yeah, Ned, you know, if you're watching, I appreciate you. Definitely. You know, and, and that, that's a weird one because I, I, it's only happened a couple of times where people that want, there are some people that live in this around this area that know that I do YouTube and I've, I, it's happened once in the neighborhood where I was out to hang, I was out talking to somebody and this random person just drove by and said, Hey Ron, I'm, I looked and I'm like, Whoa, I don't, you know, some people know me and I don't know who they are. So <laughs> it's kind of, kind of a weird thing. Uh, but, but very cool. Okay. So this is probably a more question for you, Jake from Frankie B he says, hi, Ron and Jake, a question for Jake. Are you going to use and compare Allen's double dark granular with GCFs? I think it's a grass seed. So that's probably, that's all, it's an all Jake question. Okay. So double dark, that's a brand new granular that uh, Allen is rolling out with over at Yard Mastery. It's a, it's a fertilizer. And based on what I'm seeing, I believe it's all nitrogen and nothing else. Whereas the double dark that I recommend over at Green County Fertilizer, as mm -hmm. I am an ambassador for those guys, it's basically 700 green effect at six mm -hmm. ounces a thousand with zero zero two microgreen at six ounces a thousand. And I believe one of the things right off the bat mm -hmm. is they're two totally different things. Whereas the product Allen's coming out with, it's more of a fertilizer with uh, iron in it. Whereas the double dark I recommend, it's more of a complement to your fertilizer program. So that might be an avenue to explore. That's a really great question, Frankie. Thank you for that. We'll be, we'll be doing more with that as the season goes on. So definitely some, there'll be some content on that you think throughout the season more than likely. So yeah, I don't know about a comparison, but there will definitely be more in the works on that. Okay. Very cool. Awesome. 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 Okay. So Jamar's talking about herbicides back on that. He says, um, if I sprayed image last week, would it damage my lawn to come back and spray it? If it was 30 with a 33% roundup mixture. Okay. Here's the thing. I, and I am obviously I am in the minority on this. So I just want to qualify that I am in the minority on what I'm about to tell you, Jamar. I am not a fan of spraying Roundup on turf grass. Full stop. Period. Like a lot of people will say, yes, you can spray it on Bermuda when it's if the grass is completely dormant. 
you can spray it to kill weeds, but I don't, if you go, if I go out and look at my lawn, like I just mowed it today and it looks dormant, but all throughout there, there's little spots where you guys can see green coming through, right? And that means that the, the grass, the Bermuda is not fully dormant. Um, and if you spray Roundup on it, you are going to hurt the Bermuda. A, a, a neighbor of mine tried this, they did this, and when spring rolled around, like he didn't notice, he didn't notice it then. He didn't notice it during the winter time. But when spring rolled around, had a couple of patches in his lawn where the Bermuda either didn't grow or it was very, very thin due to the Roundup. So my thing is, um, if you are going to spray a herbicide, a selective herb, if you're going to spray a herbicide on your lawn, it should be selective. Do not do not spray Roundup on your lawn unless you're trying to kill the grass and start all over. Like even diluted, I would not do it. That's 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 my opinion. But I. Don't want. Here's the thing. I don't want you. I don't want to tell you to go and try this, and then you know okay. spring rolls around. You got like patches in your grass, and you hate me for it, right? So I, you know, the oh, the only benefit. I'll put it this way. The only benefit to doing this is cost. The only reason to do this is that it's cheap to do it. Um, but if it goes wrong, if it goes sideways, where you know the grass doesn't um, isn't fully dormant, and it's really kind of hard to tell that you're gonna you're gonna hate you're gonna hate the fact that you did that. So, um, what about you, Jake? Do you ever use Roundup on turf on your grass on tr grass you want to keep? No, not really. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't. I wouldn't think so either. So, a question for you: They're asking about um, looks like lime here. So, this is a question for Jake from Brandon. He says, "Question for Jake: Do you use lime? If so, how often?" Yeah, this is an interesting one as well. Everyone's always asking about lime. I personally have not used it, at least not yet. So, I can't speak on it. I know it is used for soil pH to bring it up. Mm -hmm. I believe, yeah. To bring it up, make it more. Yep, to raise it. Um, anyway, yeah, I have not used it, so I can't speak on it yet, just yet. But uh, that's something I'll have to get back to you on. Sure. Yeah. So yeah. So good. So Brandon, so one thing you find around here is that um, a lot of lawn care services will tend to apply lime in the fall because a lot of the the fertilizers that that use slowly lower pH over time, like the so like the salts in them, they tend to like degrade and lower the pH of the soil. So you'll see that a lot of lawn care services in my area anyway, they will they'll put down lime as part of their fall um, treatment. I don't know if the same thing is true for cool season grass, but yeah, but it's one of those things, the best way to know is just to do a soil test, you know, uh, and because a soil test is going to tell you, hey, this is what your pH is. And if, it, if it's low, you know, you can add um, some lime to help to help bring that up. So just just something to keep to keep in mind. And if you need to get a soil test, um, you can visit the new um, golf course lawn that store. So right there, I've, I'm, I'm carrying the My Soil test kits, which is the ones I'm a huge fan of. Um, so go there, you can get one of those. You'll do your test. Within a week, you'll have your results. And then you will know exactly what kind of um, amendments you should be doing to your soil, if any. Your, your pH might be fine. You don't need to use lime. So if you don't, if your soil is fine, don't do it. If it needs it, then, then, then put it down. So... Hopefully uh, that helps. So this is a question for you, Jake, on lawnmower blades from mm. LG. He says, uh, Jake, when you, buy, when you buy brand new Toro blades, do you sharpen them before first use or do you use them straight out of the box? Straight out of the box, man. I'm too excited. Straight I out of the box. So, so there you go. Straight, straight out of the box. So, I mean, aren't they, don't they already come sharpened? Uh, and, oh, I yeah. Know they're you're like, sharpen. especially Toros, yeah, razor sharp. Razor sharp. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't think you had to sharpen them, um, you know, out of the box, but I mean, I, again, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't, I, I've not, I've never owned a, a Toro rotary, so I don't know how they, um, how they come, but I would imagine that that would be, that would be bad business if someone had to buy a brand new mower and then have the first thing they got to do is go out and sharpen the blades. So, um, right. So, yeah. Yeah. So yeah. Um, good question. So, so going back to our real mower questions here, we have one from static alpha. He says, as far as real mower maintenance, what other expenses, um, what are the other expenses um, uh, will I have and how often? Spark plug, exhaust, thank you for sharpening the sharpening question. Sure, sure, man. So I think it's cheap insurance every year to um, change a spark plug. So what my maintenance program looks like, and it's, it's really simple, is, um, is in the spring, the mower goes into the shop, it gets the oil change, it gets um, the reel and bed knife sharpened, all the tolerances set. Um, and it gets a, a fresh spark plug and it gets a lube job. Like they go and they hit all the, all the Zerk fittings and, and they, they, they grease it up. It's all good to go. And it comes back to me. Um, if a shop that does that really, you should be good. They'll also change the air filter in your mower as well too. And, and on a home lawn, that's probably going to be good enough for, for, for the season. Cause remember like, if, like in my case from the, the Toro greens master mower that I have, right. That's a, that's a commercial greens mower. It's designed to be running on a golf course, you know, six hours a day, you know, every day. Whereas on my lawn, I'm running it a couple times a week. So really, once it's sharpened up and it's in good shape, as long as I'm I'm cutting only grass with it, like it's going to hold the edge really well. It's not, you know, as far as like having to change oil and all this kind of stuff, really once per season is good. So 
As far as expenses, I'm static alpha. I would budget for most real mowers, 200 bucks can get all that done. You can get the real sharper, you can get the oil change, you can get all that stuff done for under, typically around 200 bucks. Um, so just uh, something to keep um, in mind. Let's see here. Um, let's see what other, other questions we have here. Uh, Swooky, I think we already answered this one. It says, Ron, uh, do you recommend an electric mower or a gas power? Not asking for a specific price or battery, just in general. It depends on you, um, Swooski. And again, Jake, I'll let Jake chime in here on electric versus gas. But, um, you know, it depends. For me, gas makes sense because all my other lawn equipment is gas powered. Like my my blower, my blower string, string trimmer and edger, they're all gas. So I just use a gas one, you know, and then I have to worry about charging it or anything like that. Um, but so it, you can get great results with either one. What about you, Jake? What do you, you, you know, some, I guess someone's starting out. Would you tell them to get a gas mower or electric? Say price is no option. What would you, what would be your, your recommendation? I'd say it, it'd be up to you, your press, your preference. And most importantly, it'd be your situation. Uh, that's a big thing to take into consideration, right? Because we're taught, we could be talking about a acre size lawn. We could be talking about a 10,000 square foot lawn or heck, we could even be talking about a postage stamp. So uh, in my opinion, I think if you have a postage stamp and you're looking for something to get you started, electric, uh, not electric, but battery, battery is a great way to go to get you started because it'll teach you the ropes. It'll get you a little bit of foundation. And then if you want to upgrade one day to maybe a bigger lawn, then that's where you come in with the uh, gas stuff. That's, that's the way I would do it. Great, great, great answer. Yeah. And that's a good point. He didn't, he didn't say he didn't, I did not cover as far as size your lawn also um, matters as well. So yeah, just something to consider. Either it, it's, you can't go wrong either way. If you get a quality unit, you're going to be fine with electric or gas powered. And I, I missed a question here. So I'll go back to it here for when, from wind chair about aeration. So this is aeration question, leave the plugs, grind them up with a rotary or clean them up. Great question. So this is a question that I've gotten some hate on before because people, everyone tells me I'm doing it wrong, but I'll tell you the logic behind my answer. So for a home lawn after aerating, I just leave the plugs and I just let them, I either let them dissolve, break up, or the next time I mow, they break up. Um, you can't, there's nothing wrong with picking them up if you really wanna do that, but a couple of things. One, you're taking like some fresh, or you're getting taking like perfectly good organic material that contains, you know, some nitrogen, like that, that's a, a source of nitrogen, a source of like nutrients for your soil. You're taking that and you're throwing it out. The whole, uh, the whole thing behind, um, taking plugs out of lawns that are aerated, like, you know, the, the place where that makes sense is like a golf course. Think, think about like a golf course green, right? Or if you ever watch what they do, they'll they'll aerate the lawn, they'll do, they'll, they'll aerate it, pull plugs out, and then right afterwards, you see guys like sweeping or, or scooping up all those plugs and getting rid of them, and then they'll top dress or do whatever they're gonna do afterwards, right? But that's a very different, um, the, 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 the goal, their goal is very different. In other words, for a golf course, their goal is to get the get the green aerated, get it recovered, get it back to, to being a playing surface as quickly as possible. For a home lawn, think along the lines of a, of a golf course fairway, right? So you know, it, it, with fairways, this is not that's not that's not as common a practice as far as they're going to aerate it and then and sweep everything off. So it's you're not going to hurt anything, and really all you're doing. In, your, in my mind, just creating an extra step and more work for yourself. I'll put you this way. I have aerated my lawn every year since I've been here. So this will be the sixth season of like aerating the lawn every year. Not once have I picked up plugs and I've never had a um, an issue with it. So it's you can do it if you want, but it's not one of these things where you're going to hurt the turf if you leave it. As a matter of fact, I would recommend, I, I put this almost in the same lines of like bagging clippings along the same the same thing. You're taking perfectly good organic material and you're throwing it away. Like why, I, I see no, I don't see any reason to do that. The only caveat I will tell you about um, uh, to make this work well is uh, let them dry out. So if you aerate like, and it rains heavily after you do it, like let the plugs dry out pretty well. Cause that way when you mow, they'll just like turn to dust. They'll just dust and just disappear. And it won't be that big a deal. You know, and then it'll make less of a mess if you wait for them to dry out before you um, you mow over them. But that that is what I do. Um, there are people that say you should pick them up, but for a home lawn, I, I just don't, I don't understand. I don't understand the logic behind it. It doesn't make sense to me, which is why I just, I just, I don't do it. Uh, let's see here. Same so, here. Same as you, so with you, do you pick up plugs or do you just leave them then I'm break down? You just leave them. Yeah. Because yeah. So for the most part, we're talking about lawns that are three to four inches tall. We're not going to go out there and pick them up. We just break them down. <laughs> yep, exactly. It's just, it's like more work for like no real, real reason. Like you're taking what was already there and you're just returning it. So, you know, no, not a whole reason to do it in my opinion. All right. Mm -hmm. So we got a super, super sticker from super TA. Thank you so much, sir. I really appreciate super it. Received. Thanks so much. 
And uh, let's see, um, Brandon is saying, uh, Robert Mahoris is chiming in. He's saying, sorry, just checking in. You're not in the minority. I live on a golf course and they did that on Tiffway 419 and it did a lot of damage to the turf. Took months to recover. Oh, I, I think he's talking about as far as um, glyphosate, like doing, I think, is that what you're talking about, Robert? As far as glyphosate on the lawn? Um, yeah, so yeah, I just, again, it's the only reason to do that. The only, ben literally the only benefit to doing that is it's cheap. It saves money. That's the only reason to do it. There's no other benefit. Like there's so many good selective herbicides that will not injure, not permanently injure anyway, the desirable turf grass that is, to me, it's just not worth it. The only place I use Roundup are um, like the edging between the grass that I want to keep and the flower beds um, and in the beds, in the, the the mulch beds, because I, there's not I don't have anything in there but mulch, so I'll, I'll use that in there, but not on my on my grass. Uh, let's see. So, um, so Jake, you have a question. It's a very important question. We have a celebrity in the house. You have uh, Connor Ward chiming in. <laughs> Welcome, Connor. And he has a very serious question. Think carefully before you respond. He says, "Ask Jake what he had for dinner." Hmm. He may not have had well, dinner yet. I got a, I got a, I got a ribeye cooking up in the uh, in the ninja right now, so I'm gonna enjoy me a nice steak, medium rare. Nice. nice. I'm, a, hey, I'm not keeping from that. Are we are we burning your steak, or is it or is it gonna be okay? Oh no, it's gonna be fine. It's sitting upstairs. Okay. All right. Yeah. So, so there you go, um, Connor. He is having a um, he's having a ribeye. Best a best mustache on YouTube. And um, Connor, dude, I gotta tell you, man, you it's you know. I, Alan and Brett were like doing unboxing of YouTubers. Like my, I didn't even, I didn't get an unboxing. I didn't get a picture. I didn't get an honorable mention, but dude, where you got placed like in the yard mastery HQ, dude, <laughs> it was, it was, it's a, it's a position of honor. I don't, you know, I, I could, I could never top that. I just realize it, it makes you realize no matter how good I get, how many, how many views I get, you're always going to be one step above me. I'm just never, I'm never going to have that distinction. I think the best part of that placement now is anytime you use that bathroom, you get to hear Connor behind you going, hey, <laughs> clean that crap up, pal. Yeah, yeah. All in love, Connor. All in love. I don't I don't want to get too much hate in the comments. But uh, but so we have a, another question here from Moro. He says, how do you improve um, soil permeability? Organic matter only helps uh, with extreme textures, uh, right? Um. So it's a good question. Um, any any uh, thoughts on that one, Jake? As far as what? Uh, he said improving uh, um, soil permeability. I guess like... Oh, no. That's a little over my head. <laughs> yeah, so... I, I mean, so, Yeah, so I'll air rating. Air rating would be air the big rate. thing. Yeah, yeah. The big, the big thing for me would be air rating it. So like, so I mean, if by, by permeability, you're meaning like the ability... Of um, like you said, you you said in the next comment down that you have clay soil, um, Mauricio. So, aerating is one of the best things you can do. Um, I also top dressing, believe it or not. So here's the thing: it's fun, fun story, story time. In my back lawn, um, when we first moved here, the for the first couple of years, anytime it rained, there was like a there was like a lake that would form back there, and it'd sit there for like a day and a half, like a, a pond. The very first time um, I top dressed the lawn, so did the full hollow time aeration and did the nice sand soil mix. Like I've never, I've not had that problem again. Like if I get a super heavy rain, like last year when Hurricane Sally came through, there was water in the lawn for like three or four hours, but it just, the ability of the lawn, of the turf, especially if you guys, you have clay soil to like suck up and retain water, just to draw water away from the surface is improved a ton by top dressing. So you can, you can do aeration. Um, that's, that's a good thing. But top dressing is really, is an, is an awesome, awesome benefit. Um, I'm trying to think what else I could, I could tell you to do. I mean, if you if you start adding like certain carbon products, like, um, like the carbon pro G product is a good one. Any, any products that, that, that help retain moisture will help, but nothing really, um, like adding sand, man, is, is a huge, a huge benefit from being able, for being able to draw moisture away from the surface and keeping the, um, keeping the surf, the, 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 the turf, um, hydrated. So that, that would be my thing. Consider, consider top dressing. I mean, I know it's kind of an extreme measure, but depending on how bad you're dealing with, um, that'd be my thing. So, so to start, if you've never aerated, aerate. Um, also consider some of the, um, so when I say aerate, the, I'm talking about hollow tine aeration. And then you can also use some of the, um, what they call the liquid aeration products, like the products that have like the microbial packages that kind of break up thatch layers and, and just kind of, again, like to help jumpstart the microbial activity in, in the turf, like those kinds of things, those tend to help with getting nutrients and and and, and moisture down into the actual soil. But um, but yeah, that hopefully that helps. And then as a more extreme method is you can top dress. That that helps a ton with um, the turf being able to draw in and, uh, and take up um, nutrients. 
Um, what do you what are your thoughts, Jake? I guess you said it's you. Know, that's a good point. Like top dressing is not really a thing for cool season lawns as much, right? Like, have you ever top dressed your lawn at all? No, not really. I just fertilize it. I give yeah, it for K and nutrients. We're good. Yeah, because the height of cut, it just doesn't. I don't think it probably as necessary for uh, uh, a cool season grass. Well, that's that's the biggest problem. Is, is what's that? What's the biggest problem? If if we're talking about top dressing organic matter, which I do know people who collect compost, um, mm -hmm. who live who live in woodland properties, which is pretty cool, but it's not very practical to be spreading it out on a regular basis. So for us, we just stick with our with our NPK and micronutrients, and we're good to go. I hear you. Yeah, I get it. Yeah, and, and and if you were gonna top dress, I would not only do only organic material. I think it's like you're doing like top dressing is a ton of work, and to do, mm -hmm. only put down organic material, and not get like a little bit of leveling. So when you eventually graduate to that real mower, you want to have that lawn nice, that smooth pool table look. So just something to consider. Hopefully that helps answer your question, Mauricio. If not, um, drop me an email, and I will I'll follow back with you. Um, Ron at golfcourselawn.com to shoot me an email there, and I will do my best to help you out if we did not answer your question. All right, so this is probably more of a, of a warm season grass question, but probably you can also chime in as well, Jake, if you want. It says, uh, what are you guys' thoughts on dethatching? I bought a dethatcher during this off season and plan to use it for the first time this year. Um, I, I think it's a good idea. I think it's a good idea. Uh, you know, it's for, for Bermuda, especially if you are cutting it really low, um, uh, if you're cutting it really low and it gets, and it gets really dense, like dethatching it can help break up some of that, that, um, you know, the, the turf is being just really just too dense is one thing. Also, if you're the kind of person that has cut your lawn, like, see, again, you take like a like Bermuda and you only cut it whenever, I always say, whenever the house association threatens to send you a nasty letter. So if you're, if you're cutting the lawn, not very infrequently to where the clippings that are coming off are really big, they're not really breaking down that quickly. Um, you could have, you can generate a thatch layer by doing that. So, so yeah, I mean, dethatching definitely has some, um, some benefits. I, I, I would, I would absolutely do it. I think it's, I think it's a good idea. What about you, Jake? On cool season grass dethatching, is that really a thing? Or yeah, absolutely. As a matter of fact, there are some people I know in the community here who do dethatch. But for me personally, I don't dethatch. I just get out in the spring and hand rake all that stuff out, and I'll suck it up with all with my mower, and then I'll continue on with the season. And then what I'll do when I'll get into the prime time of the season is I like to use the next liquid dethatch. Not only because I work with Green County Fertilizer, but the next liquid dethatch, what it does is it encourages microbial activity. And what's nice is when you encourage that microbial activity is they'll come up to the surface and they'll get any of that dead decaying matter that wasn't able to break down for some reason, whether it's too big or just wasn't able to break down fast enough, you name it. So microbial activity, that's my favorite thing to do in the heat of the season as far as dethatching. Cool. Yeah. All good reasons. Yeah. So, so it's, it's, it's not, there's, there's pretty much no outside of the effort involved in doing it and getting the material out. Jamar, there's really no negative um, to it. Got a super chat here from Josh Habib. Thank you so much, Josh. Super chat received. Really appreciate the uh, generosity. Here. Thank you so much. This is uh, Ron, uh, take the Buccaneers with the money on Sunday. You're welcome. Uh, we'll see, man. It's going to be an interesting game. I mean, it's, 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 it is the best matchup I think we could have seen. If, if Brady wins, it's kind of cool because then he won with two teams. And if Mahomes wins, it'll be cool because, you know, he's, he's up young and coming. And I think I, I really like him, I like the way he plays the game. So it's, it's really cool. And yeah, Connor, I agree, man. That steak does sound really, really delicious. So, uh, so, so yeah. Uh, we're drawing down on questions here. I think we're talking them out, Jake. Um, so uh, question here is, does, does liquid aeration leach any nutrients significantly? Um, I, I don't, I guess I don't understand what you're, you're understand your question, uh, Mauricio. So it, it, um, so liquid aeration it it will uh, it will improve the ability of any nutrients that you apply to the to the to the lawn to get down into the soil where they where they can work. But as far as um, having a negative effect, not really. Kind of like aerate, kind of like aerating the lawn, like like hollow tine aerating, like physical aeration. There's really no negative to it as long as you do it whenever the lawn when you do it at the right time of year. Same thing with like adding the you know a good microbial package or to, to to the lawn as well. There's really really no negative um, to doing that. It's only only beneficial. You're putting in like the healthy, the healthy microbials and bacteria that's going to really help um, get help you get more out of whatever you apply to the lawn. So, um, so yeah, no, there's not really, um, I don't think there's really any negatives to that. If that's if that's your question, if I understand it properly, uh, this is a question that I'm not sure I'm going to be able to answer. So, Jake, Ron, do CEC levels, the uh, cation exchange levels, um, out of balance promote weeds? Um, do them being out of balance promote weeds? I don't know. It's a good question. I don't, I've never, um, I don't, I don't, 
I don't I don't know the answer to that one. Um, I, I think the thing that promotes weed, things that promote weeds, in my opinion, are um, not infrequent mowing. That's one thing. Not mowing your grass regularly at the at the correct height, um, and then not using like pre-emergent. <laughs> like those are the things that help promote weeds. And and also if you have to be, I mean, outside of being like tongue in cheek. If you um if you have a neighbor that's nearby that doesn't mow their grass a lot like that you can get some collateral from them like weeds can can move into your lawn um from that but I've never heard of CEC levels being out of balance promoting weeds I don't I don't I don't I don't think that's a in my mind it doesn't make sense that, that would be a direct a direct um, contributor I think more like your horticultural practices and your pre-emergent like those have a bigger impact on whether you have weeds in your lawn than uh, acacia and exchange. Um, levels to me. Jake, what do you think? So I, I agree with everything you said there, Ron. Very good points you made. Um, one thing I will say this, CECs um, causing weeds. I don't know if that's 100%, but I will tell you this. There is, based on what I've been hearing over the last couple of years, it is very true that if you do have a weed in your lawn, yes, it can be due to poor cultural practice. But one of the reasons it could also be there is probably a nutrient deficiency or a sure. nutrient excess within that soil. So the weeds, in a way, do tell you something as to what's going on in your soil. So, yes, it is the it is the cultural practices, but it's also what weed is coming up is telling you what's going on in the soil underneath. Sure. So great, great question. Hopefully that launch long, hopefully that helps um, answer your question. I'm not sure if that's what you're looking for, but um, we took a stab at it. Uh, let's see, discuss some other questions, some other points here. So Lon Journey says he bought a Sun Jewel last fall. Very impressed with it. You like that and a couple other people like that. Um, there's another YouTuber, what's his name? I, I can see uh, Silver Symbol did a video on the Sun Jewel and he was also in love with that thing too. Um, so yeah, no more rentals. So yeah, but it's but I, that, that's more of a scarifier, right? Like that's not for like like hardcore verticutting. I think that's just for like a dethatcher scarifier type tool. But I, I think they're relatively inexpensive. Um, so you know, if, if you're looking to do scarifying, you don't want to rent something that could um, that could work. That could work. Uh, let's see. You said you followed the scarification with scarification with an overseed came in nicely. Very very nice. So question for you, Jake, about biochar. Um, Jake, have you ever used biochar? No, I have not, but I have used a, I have used a product that contained it. As you guys may remember, Carbon X, that used to be a thing mm -hmm. uh, that we would use in the DIY community that contained a little bit of biochar, but other yep. than that, nothing. Yeah, no. So not I mean, a whole lot of biochar. Yeah. So, so for me, uh, you guys know the, like the Carbon Pro G product I was using, um, from Lesco, like that, um, contains like, it was like 47% uh, biochar. Um, that's my product that I've been using and I've still I've still been applying that um but yeah uh yeah I mean you asked Jake but that's what I've been using for that yeah and a couple other people are kind of saying what we're we're saying here so Ned G's chiming in, he's saying yeah CEC measure your lawnability to hold nutrients it doesn't have an effect weeds in any way in other words any effect that CEC is going to have on weeds is going to also have on your turf grass so it's not like one it's going to it's not like like CEC is going to like materially only allow spurge to grow in your lawn but I'll not hurt the grass too if that, if that makes sense you know so it I, I don't I don't think that um it's something you it's like the, I don't think the two dots are are directly um like it does not directly cause that if that makes sense all right um this is do weeds grow more efficiently when your lawn doesn't grow nutrients um I don't, I wouldn't, I wouldn't say that. I mean, there, so here, so here, so here's a good, this, this, so let's dig into this a little bit. It's, it's a good question. So if you are, so here's, here's where like not having proper nutrient levels can, can um, help with weeds. So let's say it with Bermuda, right? Um, Bermuda is probably not the best example. Let's say Bermuda needs a pound, pound and a half of nitrogen per month to be happy, right? And let's say you're really, really deficient in that. So you're not, so Bermuda is starved for nitrogen. It's not getting any at all. And there are weeds in your lawn that have a much lower nitrogen requirements. In that scenario where Bermuda cannot thrive, and there's another plant in the in the in the lawn that um, can get by with less nitrogen, um, in that case, you could the weeds could do better or, or you know spread more than the desirable grass due to the nutrient levels not being where they need to be. But I wouldn't you know most of weed problems are really down to, to cultural practices, not not mowing, not using pre-emergent, like it's that those kinds of things. Are going to have a bigger impact in most cases than really paying attention to to, to, to nutrient levels. Like that's not how I would um, go about uh, taking care of of weeds um, personally. Uh, yeah. So let's see here. What other questions do we have? We're almost we're winding down. 
It says, uh, Elvira says, um, Ron, when do you think it would be a good time to do a soil test? Um, now, now or early, I mean, later on this month, but like now is a great time. Here, here's why. So I did a soil, I've been soil testing every three months. Um, if you are only, if you're over the camp where you only want to soil test your lawn once per year, around this time of the year is a good time to do it. And here's why. If your soil pH is low, like something like, like, you know, pH is one of those things that materially takes a while to adjust, it takes it takes a while to change, more, more so than like um, the, the the macronutrient levels. So by doing a test now, you can begin amending um, the pH, assuming it's out of whack, um, and and be in better position that when temperatures get higher, the grasses the you're going to build healthier soil, which means the grass is going to do better um, when like environmental conditions are, are correct for it, when there's more enough heat on on the turf. So yes, I would absolutely do a soil test um, now. And if again, if you're really trying to be a baller do it quarterly because that's because the, the thing with soil testing is it's really a point in time and it, by testing once a year you're able to see if if something is really really way out of whack in your soil and how to fix it but um but like if you do it every three months you're able to to develop directional trend data so you're able to see okay i'm applying soil amendments i'm doing these things and by applying you know you know whatever you know you know, 10 pounds, 10 pounds of lime uh, per thousand. Let's say that's an example of what you're doing. I can check the soil three months later and see, oh, are my pH levels coming up a little bit? If so, that's working. I can do a little bit more of that. Or if it's not working, maybe I need to apply more. So it's soil testing is, is an important tool for establishing trend data, which also allows you to know which products are the best fit for your soil. So um, it's a long winded answer to your question. Elvaro's, but I would I would be doing it right now. And shameless plug, if you do need a soil test, you can check out right here at golfcourselawn.store. Um, I'm carrying the My Soil test kits. It's the one I like to use. Super quick to get results, super easy to use. Um, there's even a video in the description showing you how to use it, um, is what I would recommend. So shameless plug, um, and uh, hopefully you do that. And then Ray, I answered just answered your question. Um, every three months is what how often I do it. Um, but again, I'm 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 trying to get the best possible results. Results. So every three months is when I um, I would recommend doing it, but at, at a minimum once per year. And if you're only going to do it once per year for a warm season grass, now would be the time because we're trying to get the soil in great shape for the growing season. All right, guys, we're winding down here. We're probably keeping Jake away from his steak. Uh, <laughs> let's uh, <laughs> let's see what are the last last questions we have here. Um, yep. Uh, thanks for the collateral comment on weeds. Yep, that's a that's a good point. Uh, I think uh, so. Jay, a question for you from Lawn to Learn says: Has Jake ever mowed St. Augustine? I have not. Never mowed um, St. Augustine. Yeah, <laughs> and Lawn song says looks like Jake looks like he's sleeping. Better end it. Yeah, guys. So I think we're getting I think we're getting close to the end here. I think if there's any other um, lawn any other questions, I think we are. Um, uh, yeah. So so I guess one last question here for H. He says, um, Ron, do you test your CEC levels? No, not not really. So the test that I use, the one from my soil, doesn't doesn't in in particular have that um, that parameter on the results. Um, I mean, it's is it good information? To, is it useful information to have if you want to have that? Sure, but I find that the results that, that that pretty much tell me what my macros are, my micros are, and the soil pH, like just getting those things right, is enough for you to get great turf grass. Like I just there's, I think that if there was a ton of value for the um, for most um, homeowners in having um, CC levels uh, on the soil test. Um, that they would they would add that so that's hopefully it's I'm not sure it's the answer you're looking for but um, no I don't particularly um, test for it and you can see how my lawn looks like literally all of last year I used the my soil test and the results I got was just following the data that's on there so you can get you can get awesome results using that that soil test kit if you follow the data so um, so hopefully that that helps answer your question um, and I think uh, last question last question of the night before we wrap it up here is from Robert Mahori he says Ron I do Z I uh, on my Xeon lawn I think you're saying Zoysia I guess uh, I'm going to scalp and dethatch and top dress would you recommend pre-emergent yes I would recommend it if you're not going to overseed your lawn if you're not putting any kind of seed you're not trying to, to grow new turf grass I absolutely would do pre-emergent I would do it like you know you can do it now you can do it uh, in, a, in a, a few weeks from now um, to keep the weed pressure down when you when you um, scalp and dethatch, it's I mean you're disturbing that that barrier a little bit, so it's going to hurt the 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 effectiveness if the 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 period that the pre emergent is going to work for. But I absolutely would still do it. So hopefully that helps um, answer uh, your question. Alejandro, thank you so much for the super sticker, man. I appreciate it. Super well, guys, um, uh, uh, yeah, Phil J. Yeah, the question for you about where you can get the soil test probe is. 
here. You can get them. All, all that stuff is going to be um, right here at golfcourselawn.store. There's a, there's a package there that has the kit and the pro built in. So you, so you can get a soil test and a kit at the same time. Well, guys, thank you guys so much for watching. Jake, I appreciate it. So, Jake, if everyone wants to reach you, what are the best ways to get in touch with you? How do they, how do they reach out to you? How do they contact you? How do they do that? So the main place be in my YouTube channel, Jake the Lawn Kid. That's the best place to find me, watch me, uh, comment down below um, on every video that we put out. We typically put out videos on Sundays and Wednesdays. Instagram's a good one. If you want to slide up in the DMs, ask me questions, that's a great one. Or leave comments on photos. I love taking photos over there and okay. uh, blending the grid, if you will. Um, Twitter is another one. If you want to tag me on Twitter, at Jake the Lawn Kid. And most importantly, if you would like to email me, that will be SullivanJacob68 at gmail.com. SullivanJacob68 at gmail.com. Cool. Very cool. And, and I put his his um his handle up there. So at Jake the Lawn Kid. Yeah. So you can find him on Insta there. So guys, Jake, thank you so much for coming out and um hanging out with us and answering all the questions. Hope you guys appreciate it. If you guys have not Thanks as yet, please having- like share this content, subscribe, like share the live stream afterwards. I am going to do a better job about um, the, like tomorrow morning when I wake up, I'm going to go through and and, um, and put timestamps in for all the various questions. So for those of you that are watching or looking for something in particular, you'll be able to scrub through and find the answer to the question that, you, um, that you're looking for, assuming we covered it, um, to make things a little bit better for you guys. Guys, I really appreciate you guys watching. Um, again, uh, next week we're going to have Lee from Real Rollers on. So make sure you check in for that. That's going to be awesome. So bring all your really hard real mower questions. This guy's a master of real mowers. So be sure to, to stop by for that. And we will see you guys next time. Thanks so much. Have an amazing weekend. Take care.